All right, everyone. Hello, and welcome back to the channel. All right, now here is the conclusion to the Sean Paul Reyes saga. The verdict is in. Now, uh, Sean put a quick interview that he did with David Schulster before the uh, trial started here. And uh, we're going to watch that real quick. And let me just say, for those of you that are familiar with David Schulster, who is a legit reporter, but in my opinion, David Schulster is so far up Sean's ass that David cannot think right. Uh, Okay, uh, if you guys know David and his uh, relationship with uh, Sean, then you know exactly what I mean. Now, Sean is going to make some accusations that uh, this trial was unnecessary. Granted, I agree. Uh, think about the amount of money that was spent on both sides. And then uh, <laughs> the penalty is a $90 fine. But let's just say Sean had every opportunity to just uh, nip it at the butt and say, okay, I was wrong. Because he was wrong. Anybody who watched that video of him uh, getting into that interaction with uh, Phil, there's no way in hell, no way in hell that you can say Phil was wrong. Phil was doing his job. Okay, and um, you're going to see the judge is going to also agree uh, with that. Um, if you didn't notice in the last video of uh, 7 and 8, uh, would you believe that Reyes' attorney, after they concluded uh, uh, the little coaching that uh, the officer had with Phil in his statement? Oh, Reyes' attorney put in a motion to dismiss. <laughs> I'm sure you guys picked up on that. Uh, he's going to put a motion for dismissal of the case. And uh, the judge is not going that route. Let's get into that little interview that uh, Sean did with David Suster. I just think that this, like you mentioned, David, this is a gross waste of taxpayer resources for a $90 fine, which ultimately turned out to be it. When you look at the, the aspects of a $10,000 bond, and paying a thousand dollars of that to be released compared to the ninety dollar fine of the legal expenses that go throughout this on both sides on the defense as well as the prosecution it just seems absurd and to that effect you know i did hear the state's attorney who was prosecuting me say that this was a stupid infraction trial i wouldn't agree with that statement only because it exposed city officials, the state's attorney's office, the whole apparatus, police department, working together for retaliation. This comes down to the Danbury Public Library incident where Officer Utter said 20 years ago I'd have been dead with my teeth missing and that he would have done it himself. 20 years ago that motherfucker would be dead. His teeth would be missing. I'd have removed his teeth. He would be dead. All right, so let me just jump in here real quick and make a comment because if you uh, got to watch that video of uh, Sean getting kicked out of the library in Connecticut, then you know that's what kicked things off uh, with Sean being on a mission. Uh, he got on his bullshit mission of screwing with the post office, City Hall. After he got kicked out of the library, okay, uh, and I think if you guys are familiar with any video, he's been kicked out of city halls i think maybe two to three times something like that and i know you guys have seen them because i know we anti-frauding channels have put them out there now let me just say this if you've watched those videos of uh sean getting kicked out of a uh, city hall or government location then you know that sean the the bitch in him comes out he gets on this little bullshit rampage uh he waits outside for the cops to to come out and talk taunt them right and that's exactly what he did to the officers in connecticut when they uh kicked him out of the library he waited for the cops to come out and taunt them and talk shit to them and that officer when he made that comment it wasn't to sean the officer was talking to one of his co-officers 20 years ago some asshole do the shit that sean was doing yeah he would take him out okay i understand i'm from back in those days okay uh, back in those days we respect 
respected our law enforcement officers. Where that respect went, I don't know. Okay, assholes like Sean are uh, now Sean doing his shit, and people that watch it and think this is okay. Come on, this is not the society that we're supposed to be living in. Come on, you you leave your house and you got to worry about some asshole aiming a camera at you because it's legal, and they want to splatter you on uh, social media. So if somebody acts ridiculous because they don't want to be recorded, now they're the bad guy. Really, with all the shit going on in this world this is what you choose to do and I just don't understand and let me just say anybody who watched that video of uh, Sean interacting with Phil and I'm talking to the people who support uh, Sean really watch that video can you really say that Phil was wrong that Phil wasn't doing his job Phil was told by his higher-ups the people that pay his check Anybody who comes into that location uh, who wants to record, they have to uh, now have to fill out a form, okay? He was doing his job. It's not like it, it was something that just he wanted to do. He was doing what he was told to do, okay? You put yourself in his shoes. You're working as a guard at this location, and your higher-ups tell you, and you're going to do your job, right? And you get some asshole like Sean that tells you, screw you. I'm going to go upstairs no matter what you say. You're not going to put up with that. You're not going to defend the location where you work at, where you've been working at for some quite, quite some time now. Come on now. People who support Sean, you can't tell me that Phil was wrong in doing what he did. Sean didn't like the idea that somebody stood up to him stood up to him and now he wants to go this route make phil look like the bad guy try to get phil fired try to get phil charged he wanted to see phil arrested his own video was sent he sent that was his big mistake right there he sent his own video to the prosecutor this is what happened how the hell sean thinks what he did was right I don't understand Sean's way of thinking. And the prosecutor turned around and put six charges on Sean's ass. But it is what it is. Let's get into the video. And let me just say, guys, uh, I do got a video that was sent to me by a friend. Um, and I got the video saved on the computer. Uh, the video, eh, it kind of shows that the judge in this uh, trial might have, uh, should have, uh, uh, recused himself, uh, excused himself from the trial. Uh, there's some conflicting uh, issues there, and I want to see if Sean's going to use it. Um, but if you guys are interested in watching that video, again, I say I wasn't. Uh, I got the video saved on my computer. It's some female ditzy lawyer, uh, female lawyer who ended up giving her license back because uh, she just didn't like being a lawyer. She didn't uh, agree with the morals or whatever. But she made a video. She did an extensive background on. Listen, these people are covering their bases. They're doing their homework. They're looking for any kind of dirt on the good guys oh in case things didn't go their way oh uh, again i say if you guys are interested in watching that video i'll put it out there but i wanted to see if reyes was going to put it out there now that he got found guilty uh, again this is the pettiness uh these assholes he he finds it so hard to admit that he was wrong in what he did now he got dirt on the judge that uh maybe the judge should excuse himself from this trial and i don't know if that would make a difference in the verdict but let's get into the video guys I made the motion for judgment of acquittal and although uh the court in the one case that kind of dealt with this in court trials never quite ruled on it with regard to the, to the waiver. You know, um, State versus Sealy is the case, 326 man against 65. I'm going to rule on the motion for judgment of acquittal now, uh, and then we can go from there. I think it was kind of that list in my memory over the weekend when uh, I was working in this. Obviously, timing is a factor. I think the motion for judgment of acquittal was made prior to uh, the decision by the defense not to present any evidence. Normally, when it's done at the close of the state's case, you are entitled to a ruling on the motion for judgment of acquittal prior to your decision whether you're going to present any evidence or not. And that's 
goes to potential sufficiency of evidence claims at appeal. I want to make sure that's preserved for you. You 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 did waive afterward, but like I said, this was not usual motion for motion for judgment of acquittal, oral motion. This was an 18-page uh, document, you know, meticulously prepared by counsel, and so I wanted to make sure that was given proper review. So to 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 be able to keep that your option open with regard to a potential sufficiency of evidence challenge, if it comes to that. Uh, I will uh, rule now on the motion of judgment of acquittal. Obviously, practice book 42-40 through 4242 permits, and you quoted in the, in the motion, it's direct quote, after the close of the prosecutor's case in chief upon motion of the defendant for an entry of a judgment of acquittal as to any principal offense charged and as to any lesser included offense for which the evidence would not reasonably permit a finding of guilt. Furthermore, if the motion is made after the close of the prosecutor's case in chief, the judicial Judicial authority shall either grant or deny the motion before calling upon the defense to present the defense case in chief. So that's where we are right now. And uh, obviously, now, quickly, quickly, there are two statutes here. One is creating public disturbance, which reads with intent to cause a convenience annoyance or an alarm or recklessly creating a risk thereof. The defendant, in a subsection of the attorney center, is proceeding on, the state of Kansas proceeding on, annoyed, interfered with uh, another person by offensive conduct. And then, as I indicated on Friday, offensive conduct must be such conduct that, under contemporary community standards, is so grossly offensive to a person who actually overhears it or sees it as to amount to a nuisance. And with regard to simple trespass, knowing that such person is not licensed or privileged to do so, such person enters or remains in or on any premises without intent to harm any property. With that being said, there's evidence here, of course, uh, of uh, Mr. Reyes, uh, his appearance, not only in the library, but uh, in the city hall on three separate occasions, once in June, and then twice on the date in question, which was July 15, 2021, ultimately uh, resulted in the closing of two uh, town offices. I mean, whether or not he's the proximate cause of that or whether or not he was just a contributing but did not proximate cause of that uh, leads me to believe that uh, there was a convenience going to an alarm, uh, him going back to the uh, town hall after the interim the morning interaction with Mr. Janusa, uh, I think a reasonable finder of fact may be able to show that he recklessly created the risk of causing inconvenience or annoyance or alarm, certainly annoyed or interfered with other persons in theory, uh, and that would be uh, obviously the town clerk as well as the deputy uh, corporation counsel. Now, with regard to knowing that such person is not licensed or privileged to do so, such person enters or remains in or on any premises without intent to harm any property. It is clear from the record that Mr. Reyes did uh, enter and remain at the City Hall uh, that day, both in the morning and again in the afternoon. The issue is going to be whether or not uh, he had awareness that he was not licensed or privileged to do so. And uh, a reasonable finder of fact could look to the policies uh, that are in evidence along with uh, the interaction with uh, members of the staff at the at the building to know that he was not <coughs> back there, along with uh, his comments uh, at length to Cardinal Jacobellis during his interview. Um, like I said, it's it's uh, the standard here is whether a reasonable fact finder could find it versus whether or not this fact finder is going to find it beyond a reasonable doubt. Under the circumstances here, I'm going to deny uh, the defendant's motion for judgment of acquittal. Uh, and then proceed to closing argument. But before we do, there are three evidentiary issues which I wanted to bring forward, and they are as follows. There were three specific offerings of proof as to why three specific uh, comments that would normally be hearsay should be allowed and considered by uh, the trier of fact myself, uh, the finding of fact here uh, in this case. One was the specific uh, Order by the guard, Mr. Janusa, to Mr. Reyes to leave. The other was an interaction with uh, 
Officer Luke for Fernandez. Correct. And, and, that, and that was uh, where that officer opines as to you know, what Mr. Reyes can and cannot do at the City Hall. And finally, uh, the last was an offer of proof made by Attorney Cooperman to specific comments made by uh, unidentified uh, employees of uh, the town of Danbury indicating that uh, they knew who Mr. Reyes was. So I'll take one at a time. I'll start with the last one. Uh, it seems to me that that particular offering of proof is uh, being that those statements are being offered for their truth. That they in fact knew who he was and he was who he is. So as a result, I believe that would be triggered uh, uh, triggering the hearsay rule, which I don't know of any exception you have offered to the court that that particular statement, since it, I think it's being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, would fit into this. And that, with that being said, those statements will not be considered by me in deliberation. With regard to the interaction with the other individuals, Cases, Day versus Watley says that the substance of a conversation sought to be admitted not for the truth of its content but to establish that the conversation itself had taken place. It is not hearsay. It's Day versus Watley, 195, Connecticut, 485. It's a 1985 case. Uh, also, statements of others to show effect on the hearer or me, not uh, or reader, are not hearsay uh, on such issues regarding notice, intent, reasonableness, uh, or good faith on the part of part of the hearer or the listener. That's Dave versus Nelson, 144, kind of 678, and Dave versus Cruz, 212, Connecticut, 351, once a 2013 case, once a 1989 case. And finally, with regard to effect on the hearer, evidence is only admissible in attempts to establish a fact in issue or to corroborate other direct evidence in the case. An out of court statement is admissible to prove fact on the hearer only if it is relevant for the specific permissible purpose for which it is offered. Uh, that's uh, State versus Miguel C, 305 Connecticut 562, State versus Robinson, 213 Connecticut 243, and State versus Cologne, 257 Connecticut 587, and then uh, State versus Burnham, 288 Connecticut 548. So I'll take the interaction with the officer where he kind of gives a critique as to what he thinks Mr. Reyes can and cannot do, or what activity of Mr. Reyes would be a violation of uh, the statutes here, uh, or the criminal laws. He doesn't know what the charges will be at that point. Uh, so I'm going to find that even though it may be uh, being proffered by Attorney Senator to show effect on the hearer, I'm certainly concerned about the relevance, because at that point, uh, first of all, he's not in charge of determining what Reyes can and cannot do. He doesn't really have factual specifics with regard to what's already taking place. He's basically talking in the hallway. So I'm going to find that although it may be admissible uh, with regard to a non hearsay purpose, i.e., effect on the hearer, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to. Look. Sounds like it's well done. So, is it one of the cameras? How is it? I don't know. Oh, is it's Attorney Sears' cell phone. I have a sugar insulin alarm. If you need to do that, I just I will take a recess immediately for that. No, it's good. Are you sure? She would just turn the alarm on, so it goes up. Well, that's probably not great. I mean, if you needed to. Okay. <laughs> so, so I'm going to find that all of that might be normally something I would consider for effect on the hearing. I'm going to find that it's not relevant to my uh, determinations that need to make in the case. So that will not be reviewed. And finally, with regard to the interaction between Mr. Janusa, where he indicates leave uh, when there is a reluctance by Mr. Reyes to, to head, uh, to, to sign in or take the pass before he goes upstairs. I think this is uh, relevant as an effect on the hearer to the effect that it may have had any uh, influence on uh, the formulation of Mr. Reyes' opinion as to whether or not he needed to, co to comply with 
uh, the sign-in requirement uh, during COVID, which was in place on the day uh, in question, 7-15-2021. So in short, the interaction with Mr. Januza is going to be reviewed for its effect on the hearers, particularly with regard to notice. Uh, second, the interaction with the other officer will not be uh, re not be uh, reviewed here as part of my deliberation based upon the fact that although it may be uh, admissible for its not for his, not for truth of the matter sir, because it's uh, effect on for its effect on the hearer, I don't think it's relevant. And then thirdly, the interaction uh, that uh, Attorney Cooperman and Attorney Seeger wish to show uh, that is the individual there knew who Mr. Reyes was. I understand the nature for the, uh, their proper, but under the circumstances here, that's being offered for the truth of the matter, so that they, in fact, knew who Mr. Reyes was. Therefore, those are hearsay statements and not admissible. So that is uh, where the court has ruled on those particular issues. Are there any other issues to come before the court before we go to closing arguments? Okay. With that being said, it is 3 p.m. And as I indicated on Friday, I, although this, this is, there's no jury, this is, and this is, these are infractions, they still are criminal charges to a degree, and as a result, I'm not going to stray from the usual uh, time limits put forth in the practice book with regard to closing arguments. I will allow uh, both sides a maximum of an hour, and as both all lawyers, all counsel here knows, um, Attorney so Zendon will have the opportunity to go first. Since he has the burden of proof, he can split up his hour into two arguments. And then with regard to uh, Attorney Seeger and Attorney Cooperman as the defense counsel here, they will have a full hour if they go without interruption, but for recess if it's requested. Uh, that is obviously the norm in criminal trials, and that will be the norm here. Uh, anything further on that, John? Okay. Uh, are both sides ready to proceed? Yes. Mr. Zetter? Yes, Your Honor. Um, I'm going to basically be, be commence my remarks with the same admonition I would have given before the a jury who would have been a fact finder in such a case, which is obviously I'm going to make reference to the law and certain facts which are brought out. Mainly, we're fortunate insofar as most of the evidence, I'd say probably 8 9 percent of it, was memorialized on tape. Um, so there shouldn't be a dispute necessarily in what, who said what uh, in terms of what was admissible uh, under the court's ruling. Um, to the extent, obviously, that I refer to principles of law, I am mindful that Your Honor's understanding of the law certainly supersedes my understanding and controls whatever I say. And obviously, the court should be, would be obligated to dismiss anything that I say was in, which is an inaccurate statement of law. And I would say that the same admission goes through any evidence I may refer to, to the extent that the court's recollection differs from mine. I am mindful that the court's recollection controls as a fact finder uh, in this court trial. So I just want to make that clear that if I refer to anything which is not so, it was certainly not my intent. I just want to make that abundantly clear that I in no way intended to mislead the court factually or as a matter of law. Uh, the state was going to commence its remarks by citing those two statutes. I don't think that is necessary. The court read the two statutes at issue verbatim. Um, I would note that I think the one case which is instructive for the court to consider in its deliberations is state versus, I'm going to mispronounce the name, but I will spell for the benefit of our court reporter. It's Andrew Lardis. It's spelled A, N as in Nancy, D, R, I, U, L, A, R, T, I, S. 169 Connecticut Appellate 286 came out in 2016. And as far as the intent goes, the mens rea, it makes clear that the uh, predominant intent must be to cause what a reasonable person operating under contemporary standards would consider a disturbance or an impediment of a lawful activity. And of course, that case are, uh, cites our Supreme Court's case of State versus Indusano at 228. Connecticut 795 at page 810 from 1994. I am mindful that under the um, statute involving um, offensive conduct that this, the judicial gloss placed by the Interessano Court shows that the states must prove that the conduct by the accused gave rise to what's called grossly uh, offensive conduct. And the court went on in that uh, appellate court case to say that um, 
In no way to interfere with another person means disturb or impede the lawful activity of another person. The concept of contemporary uh, community standards requires that the material in question be judged by its impact by an average person rather than a particularly susceptible or sensitive person or indeed a totally insensitive person. And that the court consider not only the words that were used, but all of the surrounding circumstances must be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And I'm going to highlight the fact that it's all of the surrounding circumstances, because it's going to be the stage argument, which I'll say in a few moments, how the defendant's actions in its totality uh, gave rise to conduct, which can clearly be considered as grossly offensive, being under, under contemporary standards. And it says that that court appellate court went on to say that among the surrounding circumstances, by the manner of the occurrence, the repetition of the remarks, which is, I think, quite applicable in this case, and the relationship of the persons involved. Whether a particular conduct is grossly offensive under contemporary standards is a question of, for the fact finder. The state need not present evidence that a witness to the conduct was grossly offended by it. Um, with that in mind, um, I think the one of the videos, I know it says Exhibit 1 has a series of files on them, which is, was admitted as full exhibits, subject to the course of limitations involving the hearsay rule. But I think that, that uh, the June 10th backdrop, I think I would say that sets the stage for this, what happened here on July 15, 2021. On that date of June 10th, 2023, when the defendant goes into the Danbury City Hall to to serve an intent to sue. He, I would submit that the, if you look at the conduct and the demeanor of the security guard, Bill Janusa, he's very friendly, but of course things turn sour or deteriorate when the defendant refuses to give his name, even though there was a signing requirement on that date as well, that all visitors to City Hall must sign in. Mindful that this is the height of COVID, there were health and security concerns as well. And the defendant claimed that he wouldn't give his name because to do so would violate his Fourth Amendment rights. But if the, I would ask the court, and the accused for that matter, to look at the U.S. Supreme Court case of the United States versus Drayton, which I think this court can also take judicial notice of, at 546 U.S. 194, 2002. In an opinion authored by uh, then Justice Kennedy, it says under the uh, Roman numeral two, I'm reading verbatim. Law enforcement officers do not violate the Fourth Amendment's prohibition of unreasonable seizures merely by approaching individuals on the street or in other public places and putting questions to them if they are willing to listen. Then they cite their Florida versus Foyer at 460 U.S. 491, page 497 to 1983. Then the trade opinion goes on to say, and this is what's relevant really here, even when law enforcement officers have no basis suspecting a particular individual, they may pose questions, ask for identification, and request consent to search luggage, provided they do not induce cooperation by a coercive means. If a reasonable person would feel free to terminate the encounter, then he or she has not been seized. And clearly, the defendant, because he did not comply with free to exit City Hall on that day. But I think the June 10th sets the background. As far as the actual day of the question, on July 15th, that's all captured, of course, on the uh, video. But there's a number of things that go on there. Um, I think under State's Exhibit 2, if I remember, there was a sign that was rather conspicuous. I think it might have actually been two signs on each of the double doors that were glass, saying that all visitors to City Hall must sign in. Um, additionally, as the court is aware, uh, under uh, State's Exhibit Number 3, the City of Danbury can make its safety and security policies in effect. There was a sign of policy where it says any person seeking entry to City Hall must obtain and complete a visitor form and obtain a pass. The pass must be returned upon completion of business in the building. The defendant did not do this. So it also says sign of information will be used for contact tracing for the purpose of COVID-19 prevention if necessary, and also on the sign of policy, sign of information is necessary for public safety, security, and privacy of people's businesses where appropriate. 
They also talked about a mask policy where all businesses must wear a mask when in the building, regardless of vaccine status, for the purpose of COVID 19 prevention. Then the really relevant part here policy on specified, limited, or non public areas limitations of and for activity, including private filming slash photography. <coughs> Any persons filming or otherwise engaging in activity other than accessing a business office may do so upon notification to the security guard on duty and may thereafter conduct such activity respectfully in the public hallways and foyers. I would say to the court that that is rather unambiguous. The city reserves the right to prohibit or limit such activity where concerns exist involving disruption or public safety or where the city hall building use policy is more appropriate. It went on to say in no event may such filming or otherwise video slash photography occur at or across any counter or division between division point between an office foyer and the work area where employees and documents are being processed or submitted. Failure to comply may result in delay or denial of entry and access to the building. Then on number five, which uh, the city clerk Jen Stiegler stated on number five, visitor entry policy mirrors what I just mentioned about city hall policy is that anyone seeking Entry to this public facility must obtain a visitor pass, which the defendant never did in either time, morning or afternoon, and the pass must be returned upon completion of their business in the building. This is necessary both for COVID prevention, for public safety, security, and privacy of the people's business where appropriate. Anyone filming or otherwise engaging in activity other than accessing a business office within the building may do so upon notification to the guard on duty and complete a visitor form. They may thereafter conduct such activity respectfully in the public hallways. The city reserves the right to prohibit or limit such activity where overriding need or concerns exist involving disruption or public safety or where the city hall building use policy is the more appropriate process for the business visit. In no event may such filming or otherwise video or photography occur at or across any counter of vision point between an office, foyer, and the work area where employees and documents are being processed or submitted. Please feel free to ask any questions regarding the above described policy with the City of Denver Corporate Council. I, and if you remember, on number five, Ms. Gables testified that she saw this number five, that exhibit, on Mr. Janus's desk from above. But it's the state's position that the conduct that gave rise to both the simple trespassing and creating a public disturbance really begins on the morning of. Um, July 15, 2021, in the City Hall in Denver. The defendant does not sign in, and of course the sign-in sheet, um, which came in as a full exhibit, I think it was number six, nowhere is the defendant's signature found in that sign-in sheet, sheet at all. I don't think that fact is even in dispute. He's told to fill out a form. The defendant claims he knows the rules of filming. He claims that he does not need a form, and says, I'm not going to listen to this and goes through the doors to the stairwell. This is all captured on the tape. Uh, he tells the security guard he's um, not waiting down here, that not to touch him. Um, the security guard, the court said it's going to consider it for the effect on the hearing, tells him three separate times to go outside. The defendant tells the security guard he's involved in the wrong fight. All these other things are sort of offensive <coughs> conduct. And then the defendant says, you're going to get out of my way. Look at the manner, the tone, the inflection of the voice that the defendant says this in. All I think, you'll see all these comments in the totality clearly give rise to grossly offensive conduct. He tells the security guard to get out of his way. He tells him he needs to calm down and stop. A customer then appears at some point in the video. He said he, the defendant, I'm not filling out a form. He tells him, the a very patronizing, condescending way to stand down. He said, you're preventing me from conducting business. He can go anywhere, go about wherever he wants to. He tells him to stand down again. And then he says to the viewer, for all his followers on YouTube, can you believe this guy? And then there's an employee of the town a president when he says that. And then he says that to Richard Janusa, the defendant, you don't want to go to jail. You don't want to lose your job. And of course, an employee is president when he says that. Uh, he says the defendant he doesn't care about the rules. He tells him he's free to film anywhere. Then he says to him, the, the security guard, you're dismissed. And there's an employee in your shot of that comment. 
He said his job is to quote, expose tyrants like you. Now, he doesn't even fit the definition of tyrant, so that's an offensive comment by itself, with a obviously very negative connotation. He calls him a tyrant with the attorney president when Mr. Attorney Pinder comes down with deputy, deputy corporate counsel, uh, while another person is president. He says to the attorney, your employees don't know the law, tells the attorney and the security guard he's not, they're not learning their lesson. He tells them that he can film across, the attorney tells him you cannot film across the counter consistent with the exhibits that I just referenced in my remarks. The defendant then says to uh, both Janusa and uh, Attorney Pinter, he acknowledges being told things that, I said, I must say that he acknowledges that by being said, you're, you're being, I'm being told things I already know. He claims he was illegally detained. You know, he's, he's told to leave the uh, place there, so I don't know where he says there was illegal detention here. Um, when told about that you can't film across the counter, the defendant replies to the attorney, have I ever done that? Well, we're going to see soon that he's soon going to do that. So his comments surely show that he is aware of the rules. He decides to blatantly disregard them, but that's, uh, that's his decision. It's a conscious decision by Mr. Reyes. He tells the attorney to defend it. Your, your city breaks the law and repeatedly tells the attorney that Mr. Janusa is going to jail. He then says to the attorney, I don't need you to tell me what to do. Um, he tells the security guard, you're disrupting yourself right in front of the attorney. All of these things in their totality give rise to gross offensive conduct. He claims that uh, the attorney tells him that um, any sensitive com uh, documents cannot be filmed across the counter. The defense reply to that, this is what I do. Uh, then the defendant's written for litigation. Tells the, Mr. Judas again, you're going to jail. Um, he said he's acting as a, a journalist. Uh, he says that the uh, Danbury City Hall has not learned their lesson. He then tells the viewer, Phil meaning the um, security guard is unstable. He needs to be released on his duties immediately. And then says that the police cruiser goes by in the video, there goes your ride as the police cruiser goes by. Eventually the police uh, do respond and uh, at some point in the uh, now Sergeant Vito Yacobelis' body cam, then he was an officer, uh, the defendant eventually goes down to the Danbury Police Department to file a complaint against Mr. Janusa. Um, And he tells him during the interview, in a non-custodial interview, he said that people, this is the defendant talking, if people did act this way, he wouldn't have a career. He said, basically says at one point, let them hang themselves, meaning people, you know, lose their uh, pool with the defendant's interactions. Um, sometimes he has a video of people a feeling people in public says that nothing happens and that's a waste of his time. He admits the defendant being deadpan while filming this thing. I would submit to the court and consistent with Sergeant Acabellus' testimony that the defendant changes his demeanor, his attitude, his inflection of his voice changed quite a bit while he's talking to uh, Officer Acabellus. He says at one point in the video, if I cause a disturbance, well, that's up for interpretation. He says to the officer, I don't have to sign a form. That's not so, but that's his position. He then says later on in the interview, I think this is around the 244 mark, he talks about how not getting arrested is his goal. He says if he gets arrested, he has to wait for the criminal court process to play out before he can sue. And then I think at the 319 mark, he says, if nothing happens when filming, that's what he technically wants. And then he states that might hurt his pockets that nothing does happen. Um, but at the 208 mark in the video, this I think is the most compelling in terms of uh, giving rise and showing what the defendant's intent is. They always talk about intent, of course, is the most elusive element there is. But I think his intent and the fairest one at that can be gleaned from the following colloquy between the defendant 
and uh, then Officer Yacobelis. And this is what he says. You either take the picture yourself, but hopefully I capture enough of it just for the court and understand the gist of this type of dialogue back and forth. This is the defendant. I got to go back to City Hall, go upstairs and start filming. Officer Guido, don't do that. I mean, today? The defendant says, I have to. What do you mean? Officer B, uh, Yacobelis, what do you mean you have to? The defendant's reply, I have to. I have no choice. I have to. Officer Yacobelis, dude, don't go back to City Hall. Come on, what are you doing? The defendant replies, I have to. And then Officer Yacobelis says in a sort of a uh, kidding way, I forbid you. Can we grab a drink instead? The defendant says, I got to go back. I have, the defendant says, I have to go back. I have to. I have to just go back. And then at some point, Officer Yacobo says, legally you can, but that changes things because you just had an incident with a security guard. The defendant replies, I have to. I have to make the point. I have to do it. And then he says, I didn't go to where the security guard prevented me from going. I think he says Phil, not security guard. And then he says, this is what's really telling. The defendant, if I don't do that, the people that watch my videos, it's not about my ego. From, it's for my videos. People are going to want to see that. Otherwise, there will be like, you never went upstairs, so you didn't prove any points. I think that just really shows what his intent is in going back to City Hall. And then, we, and then the defendant does return to City Hall. And when he goes in, he has the whole thing captured on tape. And apparently, if you can hear on the tape, a city employee says, I'll be right with you, sir. And then he says, I don't need any help, sir. He goes right to the door, into the stairwell, up to the second floor. And then he says to the viewer, so this is the first time they're allowing us to come upstairs and walk around the city hall. Well, that's not true. Nobody gave permission. He didn't have a pass. He didn't sign in. So there he misleads the viewers on his videotape. Then uh, he starts, Mr. Ray starts filming behind the uh, tax collector's office first. He walks in right up to the counter and films behind it. From there, he knows in violation of the order, he's been told that expressly by the notices and the uh, city attorney, attorney Pinter himself. The defendant walks into the folks office, and there is the security guard, Mr. Janusa, and Janice Giggler. And they, and they tell him, you can't film me. He is told by Janice, you're not allowed to film in public. And there's customers, of course, being waited on there. You can see the video. He says, I can film, uh, I can film people and customers. Ms. Gig Giggler tells the defendant to go in the hallway. He tells the security guard, Mr. Reyes, that is, he can film anywhere in public. He tells the security guard, in defense of Ms. Gabler, he, meaning Mr. Janus, is not going to be working there very long. He says to the security guard, you got a couple more days at most. These are all degrading, highly offensive comments. He says he can film anywhere he likes to in public. He says that the security guard, in front of people present in that clerk's office. You're a security guard. You're supposed to observe and record. You're not supposed to put hands on me. And then um, he tells the uh, security guard, you need to get another job. Again, the security guard tells the defendant, you're not allowed to film in here. And then he, Mr. Reyes, tells the Ms. Gibbler, I'm not going to leave because I have the right to do it. And she says, no. And then at one point he said, why don't you call the Danbury PD and have them arrest me for a felony? This is all in front of people uh, in the room. And then he says on the tape, Mr. Reyes, my job is to expose tyrants like you. It's like I think the third time I think he said that to Mr. Janusa that day. But this time in front of more people when he says it. Um, and of course, he makes that comment about tyrants to Mr. Pierce right in front of uh, Janice as well. And there's another employee behind the counter, I would submit with the near shot, when he says it. Um, I think all of these things, the totality of them, give rise that his, his conduct is grossly offensive. 
And then Ms. Gabler tells the defendant, you cannot disrupt my office because you're not supposed to be filming people in my office. And they, as you may remember, Ms. Gabler and Mr. Deuser both try to put their hands up to stop him from filming. Ms. Gabler testified that he had a camera right up near her face, which I think is also offensive by itself, having a camera shut right up in front of your face like that. She orders the defendant to leave and go outside. He asked for FOI request forms. She said you have to send them a letter for that, but they don't have the forms. The defendant says to her that you're, um, the police will tell you you're wrong. And then he tells, Mr. Ray tells him, Mr. Seducer, you gotta stop. It's just not worth it. The defendant then tells the security guard and the people at the counter that it's his job to observe or report yet again. Um, Ms. Giggler then tells the defendant to go outside. Uh, there's customers at the counter, and the two of them actually turn around at some point and see what's going on behind them. So I would submit that an average person would be offended by his conduct and all his derogatory, degrading, condescending, patronizing statements. And she says to Ms. Giggler, when I am asking you to step outside, another employee then at that moment of the video will say turns around. She tells him what he's doing is against the regulations, um, again, the defendant tells Ms. Gibbler he's not leaving. He, she, Ms. Gibbler, tells the defendant he is disruptive and the customer looks at what's going on. Mr. Lusa then tells the defendant again he can't film over the counter. A person then looks up and sees that uh, Mr. Janus has now blocked the doorway when he has stepped outside. Now his hands, if you look at the video, are on the frame of the door. He's not being put contrary to what he tells the viewer uh, on the tape. And then he tells them both, Ms. Ms. Uh, Mr. Janusa and Ms. Giggler, that he can film anywhere that is publicly accessible. And then she says, not my employees and not my customers, as the customers play look up to see what's going on. And then the defendant says, I can film anywhere that is publicly accessible. And then it is at that point, I think, that Attorney Pinter then shows up. Um, he says at one point, I don't have to listen to your rules. Um, she says again, Ms. Gibbler, not you can't film my customers. He says that he can't film. He says they have no expectation of privacy. And then he says to the attorney, you should know that, that a very condescending, highly offensive, patronizing way. And she tells the customer at one point not to back up to not be on camera. And then the defendant tells the attorney, uh, no, I'm sorry. Ms. Giggler tells the attorney, Mr. Pinter, that he won't get out. And he's falling out of the door. The attorney, Mr. Pinter, orders the office door actually closed and tells him to go in there and close the door. Now, he later, as you recall, on the video, he orders the town clerk door shut and then later the assessor's office. And I asked Ms. Gigler, in all the years she's been there, I think it's at least 12 years, not once before or after did she ever see the doors closed like that during normal business records, during normal business hours. The point being that his comment was so disruptive, so offensive, so grossly offensive, that they felt the need to actually shut uh, both doors because of how disruptive the defendant was. Um, if you get, then when he walks to the accessories off, once again he's filming behind the counter, and this is all captured in the video because we have the benefit of that. And then he tells Mr. Reyes, tells the attorney, as an attorney, you should know the law, and says that with an earshot of employees. Again, very condescending, very offensive, very vulgar very patronizing, all of these things in their totality, as I said repeatedly, give rise to this grossly offensive conduct. Employees look on me, says that. Attorney Pinter then tells the defendant, let's go outside because that's the problem. Taxpayers have business going on here. Again, because the defendant's being so highly disruptive. He tells them to go outside of the office, but the defendant will not comply with that request. And then the defendant says, again, you're an attorney. I don't know why you don't know these things right in front of uh, Mr. Janusa and others within your shop. 
He says to the attorney, why are you ignorant of the law? He tells the attorney he can override his rules. The attorney tells the defendant, um, your filming employees are disrupting. And he, they said it, he, the attorney says to the defendant, that's a disrupting that's going on to result in the police officer having to come here and arrest you. He tells Mr. Attorney Pinter tells the defendant that he's causing a disruption, so he's certainly on notice. The attorney tells Mr. Reyes that he cannot challenge him here because he's disrupting business. The defendant claims that anybody can do it and not have to sign in and take a card. Uh, he said that the rules violate my constitutional rights. Of course, he has no authority for that when he's actually called upon to ask what legal authority he has for that. And then he says, here's another quote from the defendant, which is also highly offensive. Normally, town halls are not this dumb to do with to do this. Then when Attorney Printer says, OK, so now we're dumb, and then he tries to correct himself, well, maybe not dumb, just ignorant of the law. That itself, by itself, I think, could give rise to highly offensive conduct. Unfortunately, the court would have all this uh, in its deliberation, the benefit of all these tapes. He mentions Attorney Pinter that you know employees he's trying to protect employees from filling out documents, give the rationale why they have the rule. And Attorney Pinter says many of these documents are on tables, on chairs, on counters, and they're out there discussing business. Filming, you take the risk of these documents will be publicly viewed. It's a risk to people. At one point during the, all this commotion, two women come out of the hallway who appear to be employees of City Hall. As the, the defendant himself acknowledges and says, why are they not working? I didn't force them to leave their offices and stop working. And the attorney tells him, right out, that's because you're disrupted. That's why they came out. Um, the defendant claims several times that uh, Mr. Janusa had assaulted him, but at the same time, when asked, he said he was not injured, that he had no marks on him, that expressed a decline medical attention, and as the court is aware, if you take judicial notice of, the assault in the third degree statute requires the physical injury to impairment of physical condition or pain. So that his claim that he was somehow assaulted by the <coughs> security guard is simply untrue as a matter of law. Um, so I would submit to your honor for all of these things in their totality, and I think that the public court case that I cited in 2016 says the court can consider all of it, the repetition of it, which is also, although there's a lot of repetition here, all of that can be considered by the court that each one of those things, like a building block, give rise to grossly offensive conduct. Certainly some of those statements can certainly by themselves, in isolation, can be considered grossly offensive conduct. No one should have to go through that kind of activity in their work experience uh, in this nature. Town Hall has a right to have reasonable rules, which they do. These are not extra, these are not ordinary times, they're extraordinary times because of the uh, COVID threat. Keep in mind, this is in July of 2021. I think uh, you, can, you can infer that there's a, the spread of it was quite high at the time. They took reasonable measures, I think no more than four in office, that's why they had that card. These are all reasonable means. These rules have a rational, logical place for them, and the defendant, uh, really by his own admission, decided to flagrantly ignore them, and by his words and conduct, he certainly gave rise to creating a public disturbance, and certainly gave rise to the uh, infraction of uh, a simple trespass as set forth in Connecticut General Statute 53A-110A. Those are my remarks for now. I do reserve the right and right to reserve to um, offer rebuttal to the court based on one of the attorney's remarks. Thank you. That, of course, is your attorney, Zentner, and by my... All right, so I think we could all agree that the prosecutor did a good job. He did a good job of pointing out to the judge uh, Sean's whole outlook on things. Uh, think about it. After Sean put in his statement on Phil, mind you, he wanted Phil arrested. He wanted Phil charged with felonies and all kind of shit, okay? After he did that statement, he's telling the cop, I'm going back there. He's going back there uh, no matter what. 
Now, any normal person would say, shit, I just had a confrontation here with security. It was big. Uh, police were called and so on. I'll go home and come back another day after everybody done cooled down. Not Sean. Sean has to look like the big badass in, uh, in front of his subscribers. Look, guys, I went back to City Hall after my uh, altercation with Phil, okay? Again, he wants to look like the badass. And I just find it unusual how anybody, regardless that you support this guy, I got to imagine you know whether you support this guy or not. You know he's going to make errors here and there, right? You can't tell me that was not an error. The guy, Phil, is doing his job. Honestly, think about it. Put yourself in that security guard's shoes. You're told by your bosses from now on, anybody who goes there to record, they have to fill out a form. You saw what Sean did. I'm not waiting for no form. I'm not filling shit out. I'm going upstairs no matter what. Think about it, guys. If it was you, your job on the line, tell me you would have just said, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. Do what you want to do. If I get fired, so what? I'll find another way to feed my family. Come on now. Let's look at the big picture here. Just to hear that prosecutor uh, point out to the judge of uh, Sean's uh, personality, his condescending personality. He likes to talk to public employees as if they're beneath him. It was really nice to have somebody uh, such as the prosecutor point that shit out. But uh, it's just the people that support this asshole, they just don't, they're blinded. They're blinded because they have, they have their own hatred towards government and law enforcement that they're they just, I don't know, they're not thinking straight, but let's get back into the video. We have 28 minutes left. Thank you. For a possible rebuttal argument. Attorney Seeger. Good afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon, sir. Judge. Mr. Reyes is not shelling fire in a crowded movie theater on July 15, 2021. Any video evidence before the court? court certainly doesn't depict a uh, January 6th insurrection at Town Hall in Danbury. Uh, in spite of this case being an infraction, however, it does involve important constitutional issues. Courts are going to be called upon to decide whether Mr. Reyes' conduct violates two statutes, certainly. But even if there is a finding that some violation has occurred, whether in their application to his conduct, his First Amendment and state constitutional rights to free speech are violated. To be sure, upholding constitutional rights, Your Honor, is not something that our citizens should be punished for, but rather something they are expected to do, and something the law favors, something the law commands. Now, just to address a couple of the opening comments that are striking to me that uh, the state attorneys made this morning, my friend indicates that patronizing is grossly offensive. He indicates that when the lawyer is told he doesn't know the law, it's grossly offensive. I wish I knew that in my practice more often, Your Honor. With government officials being told about any verbal disagreement, it's grossly offensive. Calling somebody a tyrant, that's just simply abusive ad hominem. It's also a legitimate criticism of governmental conduct, Your Honor. And I don't know what Phil and the original Saul has to do with anything that Your Honor is going to use in making a determination here, but certainly at common law, an unwelcome touching is an assault. And tracking counsel's argument, it's not as if Mr. Reyes goes into the stairwell in City Hall on July 15, 2021, and uses some Jedi mind trick to force Mr. Phil Janusa to assault him. So the reason why I bring that up is because counsel indicates that for some reason this sets the stage. Well, we disagree with a lot of things, Judge. I'm going to try to go through as quickly as I, as I can. It's a lot here, and I'll try to go over both charges, and I'll do my best not to rehash the case law and the judgment of acquittal motion. And you know, although I adopt it, I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can. I'm just trying to connect the dots here, Judge, because there's a lot of facts, and some of them overlap in constitutional arguments, some of them overlap in the statutory analysis, and some of them, of course, we disagree on, and as the trier, you'll be called upon to 
make some assessment of those facts. So, uh, like my friend points out, I don't mean to cite to any case law that I don't know what I'm talking about the country or, or, or cite to any um, evidence that's subject to a motion to eliminate. The procedure is such that we try to do our best with that, and I'll try not to talk about uh, anything that is uh, that pertains to people whose statements may or may not get injured. Now, we heard a lot about COVID signing in and secret documents and safety concerns and, and almost anything else that would justify Mr. Janusis and Ms. Geiger's conduct on July 15, 2021. But what really is going on here, John? What, what's really going on? It's not really about signing sheets, Judge. Entering the front doors of City Hall proper. I mean, and I address that more in a few few minutes, but aren't we really looking, Judge? at the evidence that we have in front of us that details the incident that takes place in the clerk's office after Mr. Reyes enters the City Hall stairwell, followed by Mr. Janusa, who at that point doesn't ask him, hey, sign in. He's not asked in the afternoon to sign in when he goes up to the clerk's office. Aren't we really looking at the incident where Mr. Phil is lying in wait in the clerk's office in the afternoon because he knows full well that Mr. Reyes is going there. And aren't we really here to decide what happens once Mr. Reyes crosses the threshold of that office door into the office foyer where he is in fact confronted by an angry security guard we just formally complained to the police about Jeff. And that clerk inserts herself, Ms. Geiger inserts herself in the discussion. He doesn't engage, Mr. Reyes doesn't engage her. And I submit to the court that what this case is about is, was there a trespass there? And was there a public disturbance there in the clerk's office? In the foyer of the city clerk's office. And that's where everything happens here. Right? That's why he's charged. That's where Ms. Geiger tells the police her story, complaining about filming, not secret documents, not COVID, not safety, complains to the officer about filming her employees and her customers. Nothing about documents, Judge. I submit it's not the basis for her authority to even ask Mr. Reyes to stop filming or leave her office. I implore the court to consult the city's policy contained in, in State's Exhibit 2 and take a close look at the video of the incident at the clerk's office in the video, what she tells Officer Farrell, the arresting officer, she's the one who he relies upon for his information before Mr. Reyes gets arrested. Reyes is told to leave. Closer attention, closer attention be, should be paid to the basis that's not rooted in policy. In other words, she tells him to leave because he can't film her employees and he can't film her customers. Well, that's not what the policy is. He's simply told in a question-begging manner, you are disturbing when you film my employees and when my customers. It's begging the entire question here. The question is whether or not that conduct, the existence of a policy that says, oh, by the way, it could disturb people if you were filming under certain circumstances. That's not enough. Ms. Geiger wants to cut it off right when it all starts. What about this arrest? The arrest takes place in the town clerk's office. And what do we see in the video? Mr. Reyes is arrested. All he's told is, hey, buddy, put your hands behind your back. You were told, again, echoing Janet Geigler's statements. Put your hands behind your back. You're told not to fill the employees and the customers. Why is that significant? Well, it's significant because his arrest occurs after Farrell's listening to Geigler. This is the same lady who told the police officer, Mr. Reyes busted in here and started filming people at the counter, filming her customers. And it was based on Ms. Geiger's interpretation of a policy pertaining to filming that Mr. Farrell, the officer Farrell, that is the arresting officer, takes action. But she clearly admits on the stand, Judd, that Mr. Reyes never busted in her office. In fact, the day of, her, the day of what went on, on July 15, 2021, her office door was open actually wide open. But it is telling that she prefaces her story to the arresting officer with that kind of commentary, with that kind of accusation. And on the stand when she is asked, why would you be telling an arresting officer something that you admitted was not true? She said, oh, I can't answer that. This is a witness 
who normally fills in a lot of blanks, some very evasive answers and some very self-serving testimony. But this time she's got nothing to say. So we're in a fraction trying to say, well, why? What's the big deal about the credibility issue in here? Aren't we here to talk about technical issues pertaining to statutes? Yes, we are. But she's a very important witness in this case, Judd. It's her office. She's the one assisting Phil in enforcing her version of the city's filming policy. Her hands join Phil's hands, actually blocking Mr. Ray's camera from filming, while he stands blocked from moving in the foyer of that office, a place the policy that council brings up, a place specifically acknowledged as a public place to which Mr. Reyes had access at that time, and where he could be, maybe even a place that he could film from. But she's important, Judge. She, she's the truth that gets in the way of her own good story. COVID, safety, secret documents. This is nonsense. Truth is the whole incident from the city's perspective can be summed up by what Ms. Skyver says in her testimony. But the most important thing she says to set the stage is on the first incident where uh, Officer Cantrabisi comes up to meet her when Mr. Reyes is serving his document in the town. Her overriding concern, why does he have to film and then later he doesn't belong here? Why does he have to film he doesn't belong here? That's the tale of the tape. Judge, <coughs> this is what motivates her treatment of Mr. Reyes in the town clerk's office. Not COVID, not safety concerns, no secret document. He didn't belong there, and her and Phil didn't like being filmed. They don't like the idea of filming, and they personally don't like it, understandably, but that's not the law in this case. And I think the admissible evidence supports this claim, that that's her approach, and that's the impression she's laboring under. Now, if those elements, if those were the elements, that Mr. Reyes, I suppose, could be guilty of filming. Maybe he's guilty of not belonging. But in public foyer in the town clerk's office, that's what the state has the burden of showing here. The trespass elements, I'm not going to go through them other than to say, if he goes there knowing he has no license or privilege to be there, or he enters or remains on the premises, then they have to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. What's the evidence show? I'll characterize it like this. I think it's clear that at all times, based on the circumstantial evidence from which knowledge may be inferred, because we can't open up Mr. Reyes' head and find out what his intention is or what he had knowledge of, that Mr. Reyes at all material times believes he has a privilege to be at City Hall and a privilege to be at the town clerk's office and a privilege to be in the public areas, including the foyer. And much ado is made of this argument back and forth who's right about public rights and whatnot. Focus on the mens rea element and its knowledge. You have to take a look at the surrounding circumstances and I think you can arrive at the conclusion that at all material times, Mr. Reyes believes he has a license to be there. He believes he has a privilege to be there. And the real rub here is other people don't. What does Mr. Pinter say? We heard counsel talk about Mr. Pinter. Mr. Pinter says, Mr. Reyes, you can film in the hallways, the four walls, you can film up to the counter just not over into the working area. This is the view that Mr. Pinter expresses to Mr. Reyes. And notably, he doesn't personally observe the incident in the clerk's office. He, he does some explaining before telling the clerk to close her door, but he's not there. He comes after. It's at a time when Mr. Reyes is already out in the hallway. Remember, he says, you can go up to the counter, film up to the counter. The counter's the limit. Mr. Reyes never makes it to the counter. Nonetheless, this is Mr. Pinter's account of the policy. Notably, the clerk says Mr. Reyes won't get out to Mr. Pinter. But clearly the video evidence shows that Mr. Reyes is actually outside the door when Mr. Pinter speaks to him. If he's not, he's pretty close. He's no longer in the clerk's office. The clerk, again, is reiterating at that time, he can film in the foyer again, but not her employees and not her customers. So supposing Mr. Reyes did disagree with that. If the policy is, if the policy is not just simply filming customers or filming um, public officials in the course of their duty, then Mr. Reyes is not even wrong in telling her that he disagrees with that. So he's expressing an opinion and she's expressing an opinion, but really 
It, it, he, he's out of the office at that time, and anything that's occurred at that point, it's over. It's done. Mr. Pinter's there. We're here because of the incident in the office. Can't film employees. You can't film my customers because, ipso facto, you are disturbing them. That's the, that's the position. Ipso facto, you are disturbing them. And this, I would submit, is an erroneous reading of the policy and the wrong reason to even ask Mr. Reyes to leave. No authority, even if the asking is relevant here, exists for her to tell Mr. Reyes he can't film employees or customers. That's simply not the policy. And Mr. Reyes was told this when he was in the foyer where he was allowed to be. So again, on the knowledge problem, before he returns to City Hall on July 15, 2021, he believes he can go there without causing disturbance to finish what he started. There's nothing wrong with that. Even if that's filming and making an FOI request. Even if he's wrong about whether they have forms. That's his intention to go over there. The state makes a big deal about Mr. Yacobellis telling Mr. Reyes just before he goes back, Basically, hey buddy, that may not be too good of an idea. And I don't disagree. That's what was said. But what we also don't get from the state is, doesn't that assume that Mr. Reyes was the problem? I mean, I would submit that Mr. Yacobellis, who knew Phil, helped him with his statement, knew him from the hospital, didn't agree with his handling of the situation on that day, earlier in the stairwell. I would submit that certainly, in Mr. Yacobellis's admonition to Mr. Reyes that Phil's account, Phil's, Phil's behavior was taken into account, if you will, in suggesting that he not go there. And the admissible evidence bears out the fact that Mr. Phil is a hostile man, Judge. He was just complained about to the police. Notably, even against the backdrop of this, recall the last cross-examination question, Dr. Bellis admits he told Mr. Reyes 10 minutes before he even went back to City Hall that it was legal for him to do so. And that shouldn't be downplayed. It should not be downplayed. It's in evidence. Also, noteworthy and consistent with Mr. Reyes simply going back to finish what he started peacefully when he enters the City Hall, the first point at which he has contact with Phil, notably, he, he doesn't altercate with him in any way whatsoever. So if you're going to sort of bootstrap what a client or what a defendant did and what his frame of mind was, you can also pay attention to the surrounding circumstances. And part of those surrounding circumstances has Mr. Reyes going back to the city hall to finish what he started. The video reveals he goes up the stairs, says he doesn't need any help. He doesn't altercate with Mr. Phil in any way whatsoever. But what's really going on is Mr. Phil follows him upstairs. He's determined. He's going to get Reyes that day. He's going to stop him from doing something. And he was just reported to the police by Mr. Reyes, and he doesn't like it anymore than he likes being filmed. What does he do? Yes, he does go up the hallway. Mr. Pinter said he can film the hallways. He does go by the tax assessor's office peacefully, without incident, on his way to the clerk's office, where he's confronted by Phil and the clerk. <coughs> if you're expanding uh, events beyond the clerk's office encounter, what can you even say that's relevant to a trespass or a CPD? Here, Judge, the day starts out quietly until Mr. Janusa tried to physically stop Mr. Reyes from filming by blocking his way up the stairs to the town clerk's office. And it's important to know why. In a nutshell, it's because of non-existent forms that Mr. Reyes was purportedly supposed to fill out. Forms that Mr. Janusa didn't have and in the words of Sergeant Yacobellis, hey, next time call us. What, are you going to stop him for forms you don't even have? That's not on you. And later he says, hopefully they'll step up, referring to Mr. Janus' bosses, who are responsible for failing to provide him for the forms. So it's forms that don't exist on July 15, 2021. Forms that, even if they became part of some rule, and people had notice of it, some rule of entry, Mr. Reyes could never have complied with the rule because the form simply didn't exist. That's why Mr. Janusas follows him up the stairs and lies in wait in the clerk's office. The court's attention can be drawn to that, asked by the, that portion of the Acapella's video where he's in the mail room helping, not coaching, helping Mr. Janusa with the statement. And shortly after, upon exiting City Hall between the two sets of doors, there's where the court can find that information. 
You know, it's a radius is a, it's an auditor. New term, but that may be some something people don't like. It may be a job that people don't like. Some people in my generation, for example, are aware of paparazzi. Some people have strong feelings against being filmed, mostly in their private affairs, though. And Mr. Reyes isn't a paparazzi judge. He's, a, he's a, a person who films himself and others, including public officials and police officers and employees, in the course of performing their duty. It's his right to do this in an effort to ensure transparency in government and to expose governmental conduct that should be the legitimate subject of redress. Even expose tyrants. Even say he's exposing a tyrant if that's his position. He enjoys this right both under the federal constitution and the Connecticut constitution. And the fact that he's a YouTuber, or as the state has pointed out, he makes money from the posting of his interaction, is absolutely no moment whatsoever. Other reporters, Judge, YouTubers, non-YouTubers, members of what we might, all, what might now call the traditional press, they report on government activity all the time. And news, dare I say, video, big business. He's not doing anything different. We, we know this happens in our society. And news, people visit town hall. They videotape police. They play videos of police and governmental conduct on their news shows all the time. It's part of the fabric of modern American culture. And our own courts, I'm not going to get into the case law too deeply, but they recognize being filmed as ubiquitous. And in short, to avoid the big word, it's going to happen these days. These reporters, YouTubers, auditors, and the average citizen are all, however, imbued with the right to film government action. In fact, private videos of government conduct have opened our eyes to many incidents of misconduct, dangerous conduct, incidents some of which depict police, for example, in conduct that results in the police themselves being charged with manslaughter or murder. This as an example. Videos of government conduct that have caused nationwide protest, but clearly, in no uncertain terms, have led to the reshaping of policing policy itself. I'm going to suggest that non-hearsay testimony by most officers who interacted with Mr. Reyes on June 10, 2021, or July 15, 2021, reveals that even they, reasonable people that might hear Mr. Reyes, see what he's doing. They acknowledge he's simply filming in City Hall, not bothering anybody, and the fact that he doesn't wish to get his name or execute a sign-in sheet or non-existent form isn't enough to have him arrested or charged with trespass or creating public disturbance. The evidence here is Mr. Ray's conduct is subject to commentary such as, what is he doing? He's only filming. It's City Hall for God's sakes. Words to that effect. And Officer Cantrevisi tells the city clerk, he's cordial, not a threat. He's not like that. This is what he does. He's one of these civil civil activists, and the most important part of that is, of course, the defense didn't think the 20th, the June June uh, 10th or 20th, the, the preceding video was was relevant. The state chose to bring it in, but the most telling part of what they brought in is her only question on that day is, but why does he have to film? Why does he have to film? And the end judge was just something about filming that Mr. Janusis and Miss Geiger. They don't like it. And while Mr. Pinner takes a little bit more of a rational approach and tries to explain the policy to Mr. Reyes, the things he says to him are sometimes inconsistent, and they're not that easy to understand or reconcile. You can film up to the counter. You can film the hallways, the foyers, maybe. Now that you know the rules, you're good to go. We're good, he says, words that effect. He doesn't say, hey, you're good to go, make sure you sign in with Phil, because Mr. Pinner, the lawyer, he knows those forms aren't ready yet. He knows they don't exist. He doesn't say, make sure you obey the sign-in policy before you go upstairs. Mr. Ray says, I'm just going to wait for the police. You know, He's waiting there because he is making an allegation that uh, he was manhandled, that Mr. Genius has touched him. Not absolutely relevant to every single aspect of this case, but nonetheless, that's why he's waiting for the police. Want to sign in? Non-existent forms, I know about them. Phil, let the police come. So, 
the real rub here, Judge, is it reminds me like of Sesame Street. You know, one of these things is not like the other. And the concern that's exhibited over the counter in the clerk's office, I mean, Mr. Reyes is tall. He's even from Long Island, but he's not snuck up in this, armed with a camera tied to the end of a snout that can basically be raised and bent over a counter. If he was, on the state's account, they could arrest Snuffleupagus as soon as he walks into the city hall, because he has the potential to do what their interpretation says he cannot do. Clerk's office said, pardon me, the clerk herself said that Mr. Reyes was rude. And I didn't see that on counsel's list of grossly offensive things, but she did say he was rude. We'll take that into account. And while I'm sure her opinion of this rudeness is an element to charge it, it's also telling. She makes the comment while testifying that he held his camera in front of his face. The evidence was that he was not pushing it in anyone's face and not raising it to film over the counter, like Snuffleupagus could have done. The evidence clearly shows she was going to stop his filming come hell or high water. Pretty much a fair reading of the evidence. So in addition to this being a prior restraint on his right to free speech, she's bent on preventing him from filming even before it could ever happen. And the question is whether this somehow figures into a trespass or a disorderly conduct. Our view is that the trespass is an entry or remaining issue, not solely a filming issue. And the buck doesn't stop at potential filming. The public has a right to go beyond opinions and personal tastes or desires of those who may not like the activity of filming. A fair reading of the evidence here illustrates the encounter in that clerk's office on July 15th was motivated by a dislike for filming, period. At best, the encounter occurred because of policies that may or may not have been in place fully at that time and fairly were inconsistent and fairly difficult to understand. So we can talk all we want about who's acting like an expert of the First Amendment, who knows the case law, and all that other kind of thing, and there's more than one party like that. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> Ask yourself, is it clear? Is it difficult to understand? I'm not going to cite the, uh, the trespassing statute. I'm gonna, I'm just going to say no pun intended, but to, to mention one case, state versus mention, um, that he enters or remains without license or privilege. I mean, this language in the statute, it doesn't create a strict liability crime here. It does, recall, it does require knowledge on the part of the accused that he's entering and remaining without license or privilege, and that state has to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. It's got to be a knowing trespass. Let me just sum up on the trespassing. Defendants present at City Hall in their ordinary business hours, at a time when it's open to him, all other members of the public. He couldn't trespass by simply entering and remaining in the building. So whatever subsequent rules and restrictions may have been imposed on him, are of no moment. The requirement of signing in and his avoidance of the same doesn't make him a trespasser. The signs on the premises do not put him on notice that failure to sign in would be treated as a trespass. Even if the ad hoc policy that states one, uh, even if the ad hoc policy is recognized, it states one may be denied entry for failure to sign in. Not that he shall be arrested or accosted by Phil when he does that. It may be denied entry for failure to sign in. Policy explained to him by the deputy corporate counsel did not include any requirement of signing in. It was an explanation of the filming policy, and once explained, he was told by Mr. Pinter he's free to go ahead into City Hall without a visitor's pass and without signing in. Likewise, on a second entry, the evidence, as I've already said, depicts Mr. Reyes entering the City Hall in the afternoon, not engaging in commotion with the security guard. Mr. Janusis, simply entering the stairwell to go upstairs. Genesis doesn't stop Mr. Reyes, tell him to sign in. Evidence shows that the forms he may have had, uh, they didn't exist. They're not even available to him, let alone Mr. Reyes. In short, it's nothing for Mr. Genesis to compel Mr. Reyes to comply with before he enters or before he begins filling. And, and this evidence cuts across the grain of any claim Mr. Reyes went back to City Hall to aggravate or to stir up trouble with Mr. Genesis in spite of any implication to the contrary, the state wants to bring up it's connected with Sergeant Yacobelis' uh, conversation. 
Dr. Bell says you can legally go back. It's also told by others. It's other uh, behavior and other uh, action and inaction commensurate with Mr. Ray's uh, not being seen as a trespasser for much of the time that he was actually in city hall. The defendant adhered to the policy was explained to him by city council. He did not go beyond the counter. Evidence confirms he never made it to the counter. None of the defendant's footage and evidence shows anything beyond the counter in any office that isn't visible immediately upon entry into the office. How do you film from a lawful public vantage point that you're told about by the corporate counsel in the foyer, for example? How do you do that in the foyer, which is allowed to be? How do you film the four walls, which there are four walls? How would anybody ever do that in the foyer if it was just a simple matter saying you can't do you can't do any of it because as soon as you hold your camera up to your face, maybe you catch some of the ongoings in the in the glass that's going on in the glass, but certainly there's no stuff about the case conduct. There's no there's no snooping around for secret documents. And nor I think there's a series of photos and exhibits A to N in there that make it very, very unlikely. And that, that goes to uh, that goes to the reason why the, the clerk says what she says as well. She's got to hang her head on something. She doesn't like filming. Let me just turn to the creating the public disturbance. To meet the burden of proof on the CPD claim, um, I'm not going to reread the statute, but uh, the, the, the first subsection of the statute states got to prove the defendant either engaged in actual physical violence or conduct or tense in it. We're not there. Here is no fighting or tumbling. Yes, correct. Right. That's correct. Yeah. So, so I was going to say, we are really here to decide whether Mr. Reyes's conduct was offensive conduct under subsection 2. And that's been defined by the court's judge. Under contemporary community standards, it's got to be so grossly offensive to a person who actually overhears it or sees it as to amount to a nuisance. Well, I know that, that uh, the clerk indicated he was rude. I don't recall what Mr. Pinter said. I don't think he characterized the interaction in a way that produces evidence for this court to conclude that what they overheard or what they see was grossly offensive. As one court points out, this is a uh, Superior Court case, it's interesting, uh, Chapel Dane versus uh, Duncan. Um, Stationary and mobile video recording devices are now virtually ubiquitous. They are attached to commercial premises, to public sites, to parking garages, etc., and held by reporters, tourists, and paparazzi throughout the land. And hardly a day passes in which the evening news does not feature footage of some incident captured on video for the enlightenment of the world at large. Now, while the statute is silent on the definition of offensive conduct, um, the jury, uh, the judicial branch jury instructions are also instructive. There, the definition echoes our court's grossly offensive notion. And that is the point that the same must be overheard. Here, there's no evidence Mr. Ray's filming ipso facto is grossly offensive conduct by the community standards now. In fact, video evidence on the scene at the clerk's office demonstrates the clerk telling a patron, even outside her office, during the interaction, Mr. Ray is in the guard, that the patron should move away. Move away so you won't be filmed. Fill out some forms. The patron continues to listen to the conversation, doesn't move, and expresses no concern whatsoever for any grossly offensive conduct or for being on camera at all. And that's a fact. That's on the video. And there's one factual analysis that we glean from a person who's there that doesn't have an axe to grind, that doesn't have an interest in the city not being sued, doesn't have an interest in her work being filmed because she might expose something she doesn't want to, and a person who doesn't hold the view that I simply don't like being filled, filmed and people who do that don't belong here. There's an objective assessment of that. Here the defendant doesn't engage in physical violence or make any threats. It shows he doesn't even, even create unreasonable noise was at the city hall. And I know we're talking about offensive conduct, but to the extent that that creeps in, he's behind his camera phone at all times. He's not speaking loudly. The video illustrates Mr. Janusa, the guard, raises his voice and draws the immediate attention of two patrons in the clerk's office conducting the business of the county. And nothing in terms of violation of any hearsay. Mr. Janusa raises his voice in the conversation and he says, 
You're not listening to what she's saying. Referring to the clerk's instructions to Mr. Reyes not to film. Non hearsay testimony revealing the loudness of Mr. Janus's voice attracting attention. What happens? Two people immediately turn around. Clerk shouting over the glass. We know from evidence that she's loud because she had to get Mr. Reyes' attention. She's not even being spoken to by Mr. Reyes, but her and Janusa, between the two of them, they caused the disturbance. You know? Mere video recording can't be considered as offensive. Our society is readily prepared to uh, accept this conduct as ubiquitous. And then, Judge, as a matter of causation, the defense position is that Mr. Janusa is hiding around the corner, confronting Reyes upon entering the clerk's office. The clerk's raised voice, Mr. Janusa's raised voice, Addressing Mr. Reyes upon his entry, along with the loudness of both the clerk and the guard, while patrons were present. That was the cause of any colorable disturbance, not the filming in so fact. State can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Reyes intended or actually caused or engaged in offensive conduct. There's no evidence Mr. Reyes interfered with lawful activity of any other person in the clerk's office or at City Hall in general. So he can't be found guilty of creating a public disturbance for those reasons, and based on this evidence, certainly not beyond a reasonable doubt. That having been said, even if you do find a basis to consider trespass or CPD, the finding must be tempered by Mr. Reyes' constitutional rights. Goes into town hall, he's exercising his constitutionally protected rights under the state and federal constitutions, and the infractions charged in this case are unconstitutional as applied to him. Quote, it is firmly established that the First Amendment ages extends further than the text prescription on laws abridging the freedom of speech or the press and encompasses a range of conduct related to gathering and dissemination of information. And as the Supreme Court has observed, the First Amendment goes beyond protection of the press and self-expression of individuals to prohibit government from limiting the stock of information which members of the public may have. Why do I bring that up? Because federal circuits are not all aligned on the questions that we face here today, but that's the, that's the Glick versus kind of case uh, next door in Massachusetts. Uh, similarly, the Supreme Court recognized that there is an un undoubted right to gather news from any source by means within the law, and that's Hodgkin's versus KQED. I'm going to go to some of these cases are cited in the, uh, in the uh, motion that we submitted for judgment of equivalent. When it comes to video recording, the Sir Third Circuit pointed out that to record what there is, the right for the eye to see or the ear to hear corroborates or lays aside subjective impressions for objective facts. Hence, to record is to see and hear more accurately. Recordings also facilitate discussion because the ease in which they can widely be distributed via different forms of media. Point out already, state indicates we have it all on video. Good thing, it would be a much longer trial than it already has been. There's a utility that the video serves and is recognized. As Glip points out, and I think this is important, changes in technology and society have made the lines between private citizen and journalists exceedingly difficult to draw. The proliferation of electric devices with video recording capability means that many of our images of current events come from bystanders with a ready cell phone or digital camera rather than a traditional film crew, and news stories are now just as likely to be broken by a blogger at her computer as a reporter at a major newspaper. Such developments make it clear why the news gathering protection of the First Amendment cannot turn on professional credentials or status. Here, Mr. Reyes was video recording with his smartphone from a location open to the public, told people that part of what he's doing at least is gathering content for a story. We know from what other people in the video and the admissible evidence points out, um, they refer to him as that blogger, the Long Island guy. So we know he's involved in, in uh, uh, publishing his materials and that he's a YouTuber uh, that, that publishes that information on his, on his site. And, and he's standing there at this lawful public vantage point from which his eyes and ears had a right to hear and see. 
And, and consequently, he can't be prosecuted for use of his smartphone from that vantage point, at least not to the extent such use is relied upon by the state to satisfy them the charged offenses. Testimony from the city clerk is clear. He was standing in the foyer, an area specifically incorporated into the purported filming policy as an area from which filming may be undertaken. Testimony by her that Mr. Reyes simply didn't belong there in her office on July 15, 2021, it's wholeheartedly incommensurate with any reading of that policy, and certainly wholeheartedly incommensurate with the rights and privileges guaranteed by the federal and state constitutions. In short, her view of Mr. Reyes simply not belonging is exactly why she undertakes to join the blocking of Mr. Reyes and his camera with her hand, joining in with Mr. Janusa, the security guard who blocks him physically and blocks his movement towards the counter and blocks his camera from recording. Mr. Reyes, John, doesn't need a reason to be there peacefully. The slippery slope is that where people must have a reason to be in a policy-recognized public place, I mean, it's kind of obvious. Nothing prohibits it, and there is certainly no evidence that would sustain the conclusion Mr. Reyes could not peacefully enter or remain or film in a public space, especially one specifically recognized by the city hall policy ab initio, namely the foyer. If this weren't the case, anybody, including any city hall employee, from maintenance staff to mayor, could arbitrarily command any citizen on the premises to leave for no reason whatsoever, possibly even including the arbitrary, ludicrous basis of not belonging there, maybe even snuffleupagus. While the state may rely on purported restrictions on filming over the counter, such reliance is unavailable. First and, for first and foremost, as a legal matter, the regulations place a content-based restraint on the defendant. He's precluded from reporting and reporting on specific content. Public officials in the performance of their duties. Let's just take it at that for the time being. The evidence at trial reveals here that the new prohibition on filming was created specifically with the defendant in mind. He's identified as the reason for the policy in the legal memorandum drafted by Deputy Corporate Counsel. And that was the testimony. We have the memorandum in front of us. He's cited in there. He is the Long Island Auditor, you aren't. In fact, evidence reveals the prohibition in States Exhibit 5, the clerk's one-page policy without a city of Danbury seal at the top. That's been varied. That, that policy, if that's what you want to call it, has been varied to include language that's different from what the official policy in States Exhibit 2 appears to say. Note that Mr. Pinter doesn't testify he underwrote the policy contained in 5. He, he testifies he underwrote and did the memo um, that led to or, or spawned the Exhibit 2. That, that's the policy that he's referring to. What do we know about this? Why am I bringing this up? It's also noteworthy that the clerk's testimony is uncharacteristically insistent that this policy in Exhibit 5 was on Phil's desk the day Mr. Reyes was arrested. She didn't maybe see it, she saw it on the desk. From the vantage point of where? The balcony in City Hall. And she couldn't be mistaken about that. Even those other evidence, and it's not perfect, other evidence indicates it's a document in that exact location on the left hand side where her earlier testimony identified that document to be. There's no testimony indicates this purported policy in States Exhibit 5 was actually even promulgated by the mayor. It's arguably just a document created as an interpretation of the actual policy in States Exhibit 2. And as the clerk further notes, this Exhibit 5 policy, that's what you want to call it, was emailed to the clerk by somebody in Human Resources. Is it promulgated? Is it official regulation? Not on this evidence, we don't have it. It's also exceptionally noteworthy that the language in Exhibit 5 is far more commensurate with the clerk's interpretation of, Mr. of what Mr. Reyes was supposed to be doing on July 15th, before he was permitted in her office and engaged in filming. The original policy in Exhibit 2 simply requires Mr. Reyes to tell the security guard he's going to film. These two policies in language were the subject of cross-examination, and the clerk's testimony reveals that there are language differences that she cannot explain. It is also noteworthy that the report of the policy in Exhibit 5 may have been posted. I think there was some suggestion this may have been posted 
on the front door of City Hall after Mr. Reyes' initial entry in the morning of July 15th? Well, if that's the case, to the extent that's the case, the purposes of doing so is presumably notice, but it's also arguably notice of a bureaucrat's interpretation of Exhibit 2 in response to Mr. Reyes' initial entry. And certainly this interpretation is posted, if it's posted at all, close in time, within hours from when Mr. Reyes uh, re-enters the facility from his morning visit. So for the purposes of this case, the posting of that policy, if that's what you want to call Exhibit 5, is also of no moment. Here, the policy almost certainly operates as a prior restraint on the defendant's mm -hmm. point of view, and it is not content neutral. It is well settled law that regulations enacted for the purpose of restraining speech on the basis of its content presumptively violate the First Amendment. And I cited in, in, in our judgment of acquittal uh, motion that the city of uh, Redden versus Playtime Theaters. Similarly, uh, in, the, in a different case, uh, Federal Elections Commission case, speech restrictions based on the identity of the speaker are all too often simply a means to control content. Policy designed for the Long Island Auditor. He's the speaker, he's the guy. That's what the policy is spawning. He, he, he has a visit, they don't like what he's doing. Then we have magically uh, policy created in Exhibit 2, nice seal on the top, promulgated, testimony promulgated by the mayor. And then we have another Exhibit 5. I mean, I don't know to what extent uh, anybody has gone to make sure that Mr. Reyes can't do what he wants to do, but uh, I think on a very fair reading of the evidence, these policies are connected to him, designed to stop people from doing what he's doing, and he's specifically mentioned in those policies, in, in the policy memorandum, sorry. Even if these restrictions were to be considered content neutral, which they're not. They still have to be designed to do what, Judge? They have to serve some substantial government interest. Not just any baloney interest that the government can make up, but they have to serve some substantial government interest. And they must also not unreasonably limit alternatives that citizens have for communication. Put differently, here is a law school, I didn't think I'd have to ever recite it again. But policy must still be narrowly tailored to serve that significant governmental interest. Here, the significant governmental interest behind the restriction on filming articulated by the City Hall employees were safety of government, employees, and town hall patrons, COVID concerns, and security of sensitive documents. Now, the real reasons behind these restrictions, though, are echoed in real time at the trial by the clerk's testimony at two different points. June 20th, when against the backdrop of what she's been told by Mr. Contribisi, Officer Contribisi, sorry, why does he have to film? And then she's later asked why she prohibited Mr. Ray's entry and told him not to film her employees or customers. A mantra, employees and customers. She almost always says employees and customers, but never says anything different, never mentions secret documents. And it's laughable to suggest that she had COVID concerns. Cameras and Mr. Ray's activity on that date were, were not a COVID concern. Yet. Mr. Ray's didn't belong there. And when she said that, where was he? In that foyer. Take a look at that operative policy, and you consider what Mr. Ray's was told by Pinter, the city attorney. It's clear he could be in the foyer indicated as much directly to Mr. Reyes. So we're going to pay attention to what Mr. Reyes has been told by Mr. Pinter for one reason. We certainly can't ignore what else he's being told. And we shouldn't ignore the fact that policy, if anybody's on notice of it, at a minimum can be characterized as confusing or misleading. The clerk in Janusa just didn't like Mr. Reyes filming or having themselves, themselves filmed. They clearly weren't concerned with any First Amendment right that Mr. Reyes had. Regardless of what Mr. Reyes was doing, she was going to stop it because he didn't belong in the foyer. <laughs> However different her view of the policy in States Exhibit 2 was, she was going to prevent Mr. Reyes from filming. She wasn't going to refer him to the city attorney as suggested in the policy. 
We have the regulation, she says. She never even offers Mr. Reyes a copy of any policy she thought was operative. Nothing's posted on her door or any wall in their office. She's simply interested in preventing this filming. So here, safety, COVID, filming of secret or sensitive documents are demonstra demonstrably pretextual. Sensitive documents, they don't appear anywhere in videos of June 10 or of July 15, um, may have been able to be observed by the naked eye and later recorded in writing by an observer without violating the policy. And the evidence is clear that filming restrictions have nothing to do with COVID. I've already beat a dead horse on that issue, but um, the sign-in policy is similar or disingenuous on the issue of COVID, Your Honor. The purported reasons behind the policy are general security concerns and COVID tracing. That was the evidence. Policy requires one provide their name, nothing more. Clerk has no viable explanation for why, if the COVID concern existed, no identification was required, no email was required, no telephone numbers required. Put simply, the testimony is clear. The sign-in book or the policy could never even hope to permit any viable contact tracing. Huh? It was a sham. The clerk admits there were no COVID concerns related to Mr. Reyes' camera filming anything. And it's absurd to conclude COVID concerns could be alleviated by a sign-in policy that contained fictitious names with no addresses. And likewise for security concerns. Even if you don't get by what Mr. Uh, Officer Contribisi tells um, Ms. Guyton, anyone that wants to give their name can give whatever name they want and they can proceed into City Hall without further inquiry. Policies cannot be said, therefore, Judge, to serve a legitimate interest if that's tied to COVID. Even if these purported interests can be found significant, policy in that note, on that score, is not narrowly tailored. But rather, to ensure the security of documents through some internal procedures or control mechanisms, what do we have here? Well, we have the policy shifts the burden on the public and the journalists not to film over the counter. We have police officers asking questions, well, did you jump over the counter? We got Mr. Pinter using his hand to talk about the face of the counter. I don't know that it's clear at all. What does this mean? Up to the counter, he says, Mr. Pinter. The walls behind the counter, because Mr. Reyes was told he could film the four walls, remember. So how can the public be called upon to determine at the time of filming, which locations are permissible based upon an unclear policy and a policy that states filming can be undertaken in locations that are inconsistent with one another. How does one ever get around filming a wall at the back of the clerk's office, for example, without the mere prospect of filming behind the counter? He's told he can film the wall, but remember, whatever the over-the-counter thing means, um, can't do that. It's a claim that can be asserted by anyone who enters the office and remains in the foyer with a camera or cell phone that may not even be turned on, Judge. Why? Because the mere activity of being there with a the camera could lead to the filming and or inadvertent filming of some sensitive or prohibited material. Trial testimony by the clerk here demonstrates the sheer unlikelihood of Mr. Ray's camera capturing sensitive material as well. There was no sense of material being processed on July 15th. That's the evidence. Evidence reveals the clerk was not processing anything sensitive, and while she was involved in enforcing the filming policy, she also had no evidence that any sensitive documents were being processed by her staff. Now, this is against the backdrop of testimony by the clerk. Mr. Ray has never reached the counter area to film. The lies the entire proposition that there was a concern. I'm talking about the concern, the relationship, her conduct to the policy. Any concern for that would have been purely speculative as a factual matter, and it would constitute a prior restraint, wholeheartedly unjustifiable reason to prevent Mr. Reyes' filming. And I know over every one of them, but these other articulated interests simply don't accord with the restrictions imposed either. Uh, filming doesn't endanger the employees or the patrons. Uh, signing in with uh, out verification doesn't provide additional security or COVID aid. Policies as they're enforced will leave the defendant no alternative to recording public officials and exercise of their functions at City Hall at all. Notably, city officials, I don't know if you're allowed to take judicial notice of this, but city officials are almost always performing their duties behind counters. 
what they do behind the counters there, City Hall. In any event, um, for the aforementioned reasons, this court should apply the strict scrutiny standard to this set of circumstances because town halls and city halls have, by long tradition, or government, fiat been devoted to assembly and debate. Arguably, even the application of intermediate scrutiny would yield the same result in this case. Policy is aimed at him. It's specifically aimed at him because he's exercising his rights. And I'll get very briefly to the equal protection claim, but certainly this violates his First Amendment and it's a content-based restriction. I've talked about the federal case law. I just want to draw your attention to the Connecticut Constitution which deals with the scenario in a wholeheartedly different way. And it's more protective of our free speech rights. Article 1, Section 4 of our Constitution provides every citizen may freely speak, write, and publish his sentiments on all subjects, being responsible for the abuse of that liberty. Article 5, no law shall be passed to curtail or restrain the liberty of speech or the press. Article 1st, Section 14, these citizens have a right in a peaceable manner to assemble for their common good and to apply to those invested with the powers of government for redress of grievances or other proper purposes by tradition, address, or remonstrance. This analysis for content neutral regulation of the Connecticut Constitution wouldn't rely on the nature of the form. That's why I'm pointing it out. Our courts still employ the compatibility test for claims that are brought under the Connecticut Constitution, any that violate the uh, free speech rights that are contained therein. This approach uh, goes like the relevant inquiry is a case-by-case -case balancing of the right to free speech against the compelling interests of the preventing unreasonable interference with the normal activity of a particular public place. Thus, there has to be some evidence the specific use of a particular government property compelled some level of speech. And I'm almost finished here. In the present case, there's no evidence of recording from a lawful public vantage point. The foyer in the town hall's office interferes with the activity of city hall employees or the ad hoc restrictions on video recording over the counter was a compelled restriction. Uh, draw your honor's attention very lastly uh, to the second constitutional claim being uh, put forward that the statutes as applied in this case, violate the defendant's right also to equal protection. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution essentially direction all persons similarly situated should be treated similarly. They should be treated alike. A violation of equal protection by selective treatment arises if the person compared with others similarly situated was selectively treated. And two, such selective treatment was based on impermissible considerations such as race, religion, intent to inhibit, or punish the exercise of constitutional rights or malicious or bad faith intent to injure. Punish the exercise of constitutional rights because he didn't belong there. Why does he have to feel he didn't belong there? Clearly here the city's punishing Mr. Ray is for an exercise of his constitutional right. Simply didn't belong there, Judge. And as I discussed uh, previously, he's engaged, he's engaged in the constitutional protected activity on June 10th, 2021, and July 15th, 2021. And between these two occasions, mayor and city hall officials came up with this new ad hoc policy on filming and access to city hall. It's also been a self-serving interpretation of that policy. They even been taped to the front doors of city hall within an hour of the time Mr. Reyes left an effort to complain to the police about being accosted and prevented by the security guard from going to the second floor to make his FOIA request. The fact that FOIA forms don't exist of no moment. Even if Mr. Reyes is wrong about the clerk's office should have them, it's of no moment. Requesting FOIA forms in a continuing conversation, Judge, I might add, about his business at City Hall. You know, Council stood up here and talked about offensive conduct, right? And, and, and what came to my mind is, is like the litany of different things the council says is grossly offensive conduct. And it's summed up by saying, you know, how dare you unwashed peasants disagree with your lord? 
This is really a, 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 an exercise where grossly offensive doesn't include being patronizing, doesn't include calling a government official a tyrant. That's his opinion. Clearly, the policies are aimed at Mr. Reyes. Charge misconduct, the defendant rises specifically from the violations of these policies and their selective application to him, and therefore should be dismissed as unconstitutional. The state cannot provide proof beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Reyes intended to commit the infraction, that he is the proximate but for cause of the conduct. That, uh, that leads to the activity for which he's being charged. And it's not just a simple matter that trespass somehow morphs into, did you obey a filming policy that I don't like, that you don't belong here one minute. to engage in? in? One minute. For those reasons, Your Honor, I would ask the court to find in Mr. Reyes' favor and to the extent that um, the court has uh, considered the constitutional arguments find that in their application these statutes are unconstitutional as applied there. Thank you. Is there any rebuttal? Uh, yes, sir. Alright, so let me just say that the amount of money that Reyes' lawyers charged Reyes, uh, I guess they earned it. They earned it. They were pretty good, okay? Now, let me just say, unfortunately, uh, uh, all the shit that they said there to make uh, Reyes' actions sound normal and legal, uh, as we all know, we, the people that watch his videos on a daily, we all know Reyes is full of shit. Reyes does this for the intentions of getting a reaction. He has nothing good. There's no good intentions on what he does, okay? Let's be real here. If Reyes felt, and Reyes has been doing this now, what, two years now? Don't you think after the first or the second, after the third time, after the third or the fourth time of him going to a city hall and realizing that, hold on, people actually bug out when they see me walking with a camera. Let me go about um, putting out literature or let me try something different, okay? But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that because his whole intentions is to get a reaction that his subscribers get off on, okay? So again, his lawyers, unfortunately, into the shit happens to them, okay? Because right now, the lawyers are defending him. They're getting paid to say this shit, okay? And to the lawyers themselves has one of these assholes go to their office and play that stupid-ass game of, uh, I'm here to fill out a, uh, a request for a public forum or whatever, because as we all know, that's their excuse to get into the building, okay? Whatever location they go to, uh, they use that as an excuse uh, to fill out a public request form as an excuse to be in that building. Now, once they're in that building, they're let in there to get that public request form. Oh, everything is fair game. There goes the recording. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there and record this until I get somebody who overreacts on me, okay? And that's the whole ideal of what they do. Again, I say, after the third or the fourth time of Reyes figuring out, hold on, people act crazy when I go in here with the camera. Let me try something different. Let me, if his whole intentions is to educate the people on people's First Amendment rights, there's so many other ways to go about it. Literature, put literature out there. Or when you go to these locations, give them the respect, a heads up. Hey, I'm here to show my viewers an interaction between you guys, the government, and me, the citizen, okay? And go from there, okay? But if you don't, this bullshit about you going into their location walking around like a maniac, not maniac, but you know what I mean, causing the suspicion. Again, I got to bring 9-11. I had some knucklehead who made a comment when I said 9-11, and the uh, comment was, oh, a camera brought the, uh, the buildings down? No, it was a, a bunch of things that came into play, okay? Lack of security was one of them. If you guys, I watched a documentary where uh, two weeks prior to the buildings coming down, uh, there were uh, 
uh, fake uh, fake utility guys that were in there doing all kind of shit, okay? I, in my opinion, there was a lot more to just airplanes taking those buildings down. But, again, that's a whole different video, okay? So, lack of security, okay? As we all know, there are people out there that hate this country and will just go about uh, doing the most craziest shit to hurt us, okay? So, now, if the way the frauditors want, frauditors want uh, anybody to be able to go into these government buildings and not ask any questions think about that shit they want anybody to walk into these buildings and not ask any questions now signing in listen i think it's important my opinion okay now i agree with the bullshit of just uh signing in and not requesting a id with that sign in because as reyes has uh, proved he can give just about any damn name like ben franklin and get away with it so i would say if you're going to request uh somebody to sign in then I request an ID to uh, back up that signature of you signing in. Now, uh, again, the lawyers make it sound like uh, I couldn't believe that they made it sound like that was uh, at the city hall was asking for too much, asking people to sign in, and that Reyes said anybody can do it, and uh, nobody has to follow that rule. Think about it, what Reyes is saying. Reyes wants anybody, if if your city hall, where you live at, if your city hall requires signing in, think about it. People who have been watching Reyes and they figure, oh, he's gotten away with it, it must be legal. And they start going in there and doing that shit too. I'm not going to sign in and do what you want to do to me. Lock me up. I'm going to take you to court and sue and blah, blah, blah. Come on. You're causing chaos. That's all this man, in my eyes, that's all I see is this man causing chaos in this country. If he really had good intentions, really had good intentions, there are so many things that he could be doing. Again, I say, bringing out literature, commercial, the amount of money that asshole makes, you can buy airtime on the radio put it out there listen we want to let uh, the government know that there are people that want to record uh, public employees while they're working let them know ahead of time and i will blame our government for this shit too for them not putting it out to all of the city halls throughout the united states that they have assholes out there that want to get a reaction from them i would say the government is at fault on that too now again my way of thinking uh, that uh, when they walk into a uh, city hall the hallways and stuff like that uh, so be it legit make it legal okay I've seen some of these uh, city halls they have nice things nice displays I could see people wanting to record take pictures and so on but the minute you go into an office to conduct legitimate business where your uh, personal things are going to be exchanged right there that's it recording is ended no recording Recording at all, period. Now, again, he tries to play that bull crap that uh, he never went past the counter. And, and that's not what they're talking about. I'm thinking I'm thinking right, but uh, what they're saying is when you aim your camera, wherever the hell you're standing at, when you aim your camera at that counter, you're pretty much getting uh, the shit that's beyond that counter as well. Okay? So that's what they mean about uh, uh, no recording the counter and beyond. They're not talking about you physically going and putting your hand or your cell phone past the counter okay so uh, as we all know Reyes likes to twist things around likes to paint himself as the victim you know again I'm gonna end this conversation because I can go on and on there's a lot of shit that Reyes uh, again their lawyers Reyes's lawyers uh, they want to make this shit law uh, I don't know, sound normal, what he does normal. Auditor? I, that would have been a, how the hell do you consider this guy an auditor? You know, think about it. One minute he's a convicted armed robber. Then he's working in a warehouse. He, uh, I think he lost his job when COVID hit. The next thing you know, he wakes up and now he's some legal scholar. Really? Really? An auditor? I think that's a major thing right there. What background does he have to consider himself an auditor? What background does he have to go into these government locations and audit them? Come on now. 
So I'm going to end the conversation here because, like I said, I can go on and on and on. And uh, let's get back to the video. The defendant's assertion that uh, he adheres to the policy is simply untrue. The evidence in no way supports that assertion. The policy, both the visitor entry and the other policy of uh, safety security policy in effect mirror one another. The city reserves the right to prohibit unlimited such activity where overriding need or concerns involving disruption of public safety or where the city hall building use policy is more appropriate for the business visit. In no event may such filming or other video photography occur at or across any counter of the vision point between an office foyer and the work area where employees and documents are being processed or submitted. That's exactly what he did here. The evidence is undisputed and supports he clearly filmed across that counter. And I respectfully disagree with my counsel, fellow counsel. He walked into the town clerk's office and the accessor's office. He crossed the threshold of the door. That's not true. And even beyond that, he still violated the policy, even if the court were to find he was still in the foyer. He clearly filmed across the counter. They have the reasons uh, for that. Calling somebody a tyrant is, um, you know, by um, definition, um, I don't know. It's a ruler who uses power harshly. That's not Mr. Tanus at all. That was nothing more than to antagonize uh, him uh, as well. Um, they claim that Mr. Tanus knew that he was coming back. There's no evidence to support that. The council's talking about how uh, police thought he was not a threat. That was back on June 10th. The court already expressly indicated it would not consider that as hearsay evidence. I'm not sure why counsel cited that. Any comments made by um, um, uh, the, def the defendant involving any other officers would not be considered. Um, this is really not a First Amendment case. The policy itself is content neutral, contrary to what the defendant has <coughs> asserted. Why does he go there to film the cause of disturbance? He expressly goes back to City Hall a second time by his own admission because he wants to satisfy his viewers and they want to see what happens when he violates uh, the policy I would submit. Um, his right to go to City Hall uh, does not equal his right to violate uh, the policy that was in place. He flagrantly violates it. He refuses to sign in. He films across the counter. He causes a disturbance. I'm not going to recite the evidence that I mentioned uh, during my um, opening uh, comments. I think each and every one of those give rise to show that his conduct was grossly uh, offensive. He goes back to City Hall to finish what he started because he wants to satisfy his people and put something else out there on YouTube for uh, profit purposes. Um, I would also submit the council went down the road of the First Amendment without going into great detail. If the court wants to take a look at I would submit under, there's two cases the court can look at it at its convenience. Cornelius versus NAACP Legal Defense and Internal <coughs> Fund Incorporated, 473 U.S., 788 from 1985. The First Amendment, it says, well, the First Amendment does not forbid a viewpoint neutral exclusion of speakers who would disrupt a non-public forum and hinder its effectiveness for its intended purpose. Nothing in the Constitution requires the government freely to grant access to all who wish to exercise their right to free speech on every type of government property without regard to the nature of the property or to the disruption <coughs> that might be caused by the speaker's actions. The U.S. Supreme Court has adopted a form analysis as a means of determining when the government's interest in limiting the use of its property to its intended purpose outweighs the interest of those wishing to use the property for other purposes. Accordingly, the extent to which the government can control access depends on the nature of the relevant form. Access to a non-public form can be restricted 
as long as the restrictions are reasonable and are not an effort to suppress expressing merely because public officials oppose the speaker's view. This had nothing to do with viewpoints of any kind. This, the uh, offices that he filmed were a, uh, a limited forum. Um, the one. The other case I would cite for the court's attention is Sheets versus City of Punta Gorda at 415 Federal Supplement, third edition at 1115, page, at, uh, that's a 2019 case. This case involved a municipal ordinance in the state of Florida regarding building inside a government building, namely Town Hall. Uh, the, the, pub, the parties agreed, and I think the evidence here is that the City Hall is a limited public forum. As a result, the level of scrutiny is not strict scrutiny, but a rational test where the restrictions on a limited public forum need only be reasonable and viewpoint neutral. Uh, that's where we, that's what we have uh, in this particular case. Um, It said that to survive a First Amendment challenge, this ordinance in Florida had to be reasonable, which was measured in light of the purpose of the forum and all the surrounding circumstances. He said there, as in this case, the purpose of City Hall is to conduct legitimate public business. Um, in that case, the uh, ordinance there restricted those who would not consent. But the point is, it's a, it was a limited, uh, public forum where the test for scrutiny is rational basis. It is not strict scrutiny or the intermediate one contrary to what the defendant may think. In the Florida case, when I just mentioned, the ordinance there was basically viewpoint neutral because it did not target any viewpoint ideology or opinion. The policies do the same here. They don't target any of that nature is here as well. <coughs> they said in that case in the floor, the ordinance applied the same to everyone, no matter why they show up at City Hall with a camera. The same with the policy in this case. But I would submit <coughs> that the failure to sign in sheet on two occasions, he blatantly violates it, goes right past it, says I'm good, but say, can I be right with you, sir? He says, I don't need any help, goes right past it, goes upstairs to cause a disturbance and starts filming across the counter in three separate offices. Um, they give the reason for that. The policy in place, the height of COVID, they keep track of the number of people going in, they have a hall pass, they keep social distancing to monitor for safety, those are all. You can, you can sign in the policy, turns out they're not the filming policy. Correct. The, the filming policy, the, the basis for that, there was significant evidence presented to show the basis for that. It is the risk of exposing sensitive material, people's data, identification theft, things. I mean, uh, if people get someone's social security number that could subject them as a court aware to the potential for identity theft, there was a reasonable, rational basis for that policy of not filming. To protect people's interest, their privacy, to the conversation, the contents of the document, things of that nature, there was a rational basis for that policy. They told him repeatedly what he could do. There was a written policy that they told him verbally many, many times over throughout that day. He flagrantly violated it. He caused a disruption on many levels based on people's reactions, the shutting of the door. This has nothing to do with the First Amendment content of the speech. It happens to do with his actions disrupting the business um, that day. And uh, him, the trespass, I think, goes without saying when he refused to sign in on two separate occasions who willfully violates both of those uh, policies. I think the state has presented more than ample evidence to show that the defendant violated 53A110A, which is the uh, um, simple uh, trespass statute, and he, that he violated creating public disturbance because his conduct certainly can give rise to show that it was grossly offensive by community standards today and that such an average person would be offended having viewed this entire video and his actions and the reactions that result the shutting of the doors, things of that nature, the, the derogatory comments that he made within the earshot of the public, all of those in their totality, in their entirety, give rise to grossly offensive conduct. The defendant violated 
that infraction as well. Thank you. Thank you both. All right. So here's what we're going to do next. I'm going to take a recess. I would ask counsel to compare notes with regard to the exhibits which have been put aside and marked as such. So before the exhibits are brought to me during deliberation, I want to make sure that both counsel agree that all the right exhibits are properly marked and will be coming in, in in total. We've all had cases where sometimes there are only exhibits come in and we want to avoid that. So uh, I'm going to take a recess, compare notes now with regard to the exhibits that have been uh, kept by the clerk's office. If you both agree that there are, uh, the exhibits are in the proper order and in the proper place for me to be able to uh, peruse them during deliberation, I won't come back out until uh, between 5 up and 5 today. If we go a little over, so be it. If I have the verdict, then it will come out today. If I do not, uh, I will come out and tell you that I do not, and we will continue the matter until tomorrow. With that being said, uh, I'm going to take a recess now. Council, please make sure you have the proper uh, exhibits available. And when you have agreed, if you have agreed, uh, have the marshal bring them in to me. If you don't agree that the exhibits are as they're supposed to be in the proper place, let the marshal know I will come out and we will handle any dispute that has arisen from that recess. All right, of course, now recess. That's what his 
arguably his brain is built up. Uh, he clicks happen when he gets a reaction out of people, and they don't happen when he doesn't get a reaction out of people. Uh, with regard to interfere with another person, there's certain factual evidence that as a result of the interaction going on on the second floor, not one but two city offices were closed. But all of this has to be brought about by offensive conduct. And the offensive conduct has to be under contemporary community standards so grossly offensive to a person who actually overhears it or sees it as to amount to a nuisance. Certainly, Mr. Reyes, once he gets engaged, is at times condescending, is at times humorous, is at times charming, and is at times uh, argumentative. But he never initiates the interaction. He always comes in, and what I've seen in these videos, of all times here for our case, he stands there, holds his camera, and either he is interacted with or he is not. Query whether or not this would be a long interaction with the public or the office if there was no interaction. But under the circumstances here, the, uh, the interaction was first with the security guard, Mr. Janusa, then it was with both our uh, deputy corporation council as well as our town clerk. And it's arguable as to whether or not uh, it is Mr. Reyes or certainly the conduct of the uh, Mr. Janusa and uh, our two witnesses who testified as to argue as to which party accelerates uh, and escalates uh, the encounter to the point where uh, people came out of their offices and doors were shut. I don't find that the conduct here amounts to offensive conduct under the statute. I don't understand. What is that? What is that? Okay. I don't understand why uh, uh, there has to be argumentative uh, interaction. I certainly um, don't understand necessarily why the both offices were closed, because certainly factually, on the circumstances here, he, uh, although it was he was filming within the threshold of, of, of the town clerk's office, uh, the evidence is clear he never approaches the counter. Now, whether that's because he gets stopped by uh, the town clerk or whether he uh, gets stopped by Mr. Janusa, uh, or if that's because he decides that the policy is can't come over the counter, therefore he won't come over the counter. Uh, he never actually does. Um, but that's of no import if I don't find that uh, the conduct constitutes offensive conduct under the statute, and I do not. So I find uh, Mr. Reyes not guilty of creating a public disturbance. With regard to 53A110A, simple trespass, an infraction, a person is guilty of simple trespass, knowing that such person has not license or privilege to do so, such person enters or remains in or on any premises without intent to cause harm to any property. Okay. In this situation, we have a silent policy and we have a time and place where there were COVID policies all over the state of Connecticut. The governor, Governor Lamont, had his executive orders, which were subject to much criticism and controversy with regard to whether restaurants could open, whether town buildings can open and hold and hold meetings, uh, whether the Capitol itself would be open and be accessible to members of the public. I can tell you, I think we all lived it, the Capitol was not accessible to members of the public for a very long time. And uh, the town halls were closed to the point where I think our town clerk here indicated that they were conducting business in the parking lot at, at one point or another. Uh, it, was a, it was a time unlike anything I had seen, certainly in my 50, then 51, 52 years. And, and I think people were trying to do the right thing, trying to protect the safety and welfare of the citizenry, mask requirements, restaurants closed, restaurants open, you can only have your mask on uh, to and from the door, but you can take your mask off at the table. You, you can only have 50% uh, capacity, you can have 25% capacity, etc. There were, there were uh, policies put in place with the overarching goal to protect the safety and security of the, of the public as a whole. So, 
With that being said, in this particular instance, we do have here the City of Danbury, Connecticut safety and security policies in effect. The sign-up policy, the mask policy, policy and specified limited or non-public areas limitations of for activity, including private filming, photography, etc. At the bottom it says, failure to comply may result in delay or denial of entry and access to the building. There's an exhibit that shows the other sign, which indicates must sign it upon entry. But as you're watching the video, when uh, later on in the afternoon of the 15th, when uh, Mr. Drissel holds the door for now Sergeant Cabellas, there is uh, a view of this policy posted to the left of the door and the glass uh, just beyond, just to the left of the door that opens and shuts, which should be given access to the building. And the sign on policy says, any person seeking entry to City Hall must obtain and complete a visitor form and obtain a pass. The pass must be returned upon completion of business in the building. Sign the information will be used for contact tracing for the purpose of COVID-19 prevention. If necessary, sign in information is necessary for public safety, security, and privacy of people's business where appropriate. Now look, I'm also going to tell you that I watched, test, watched the videos. I heard the testimony. I watched the videos again. Here, while the testimony is being done and cross-examination certainly elicited testimony that the sign-in sheet, as it was currently being operated by the city of Danbury, it was going to be a possibility to do effective contact tracing. I think that's clear. Uh, anybody can sign any name, uh, and there's no email address, there's no phone number. Contact tracing, I think, would be uh, difficult to accomplish. However, it doesn't mean that the, the, the signing policy and the hope to be able to conduct the signing policy for the purpose of safety and contact tracing is an appropriate restriction. Now, on top of that, we had testimony from uh, the town clerk and it's also ample information related forth on the video that when you signed in, another purpose was to get a pass to go within the building. And then we have testimony from the town clerk that that was uh, done so that they can restrict and regulate how many people were in any given town office at any given time. Now look, I reviewed the signage for that day. And we had people going into the town clerk's office at 815, 828, 837. There's a gap, 905, 907, 2 and then there's again 918, 1028, 1045, etc. So there are three people, there's a gap, there's four people. There's no way to, to, to account for on that sign in sheet when the people come back and return the, uh, the passes. But uh, that just could have been sloppy bookkeeping on behalf of the city of Danbury. I don't know. But I do know. That when COVID was in effect, and that's you know that was March of 2020, certainly through the end of 2020, this is still involved. The governor's and executive orders were in effect uh, well into 2021, and the uh, Capitol building certainly was closed to the public at that point going forward. I think it took a while uh, for individual municipalities, individual uh, entities to come out of. Um, the COVID policy, certainly when I started here as a judge in June, plexiglass was still mandated to be in front of, of, of me here between myself and the clerk. And uh, when I was uh, still a prosecutor in uh, Milford, uh, there was a policy, of course, masks in the courtroom, masks in the building. You were able to take your masks off in your office if no one was in the office with you. My point is, there were COVID policies in effect, and I think all of us would, if we're really given an opportunity to be candid with ourselves, would say some of them we just didn't understand. We just didn't know what effective, what, how effective those policies were or not were with regard to the public safety. But we all followed them because that's what the regulation said to do. That's what we were asked to do. I said employees we were asked to do it as members of the public community court, the court building. That's what you were asked to do. And, and everyone essentially did it 
or they weren't allowed in the building without a mask, etc. So we have here also, by the way, the affirmative defense of criminal trespass, which wasn't mentioned in either closing an argument to show the affirmative defense to the defense to the prosecution for criminal trespass that the premises at the time of the entry or remaining were open to the public and the actor complied with all lawful conditions imposed on them access to or remaining in the premises. So certainly that goes without saying, but I'm saying it to be complete. There's an affirmative defense that you can't trespass in a public place. It's only overcome if you show that there was a lawful condition imposed on access to or remaining in the premises. That's 53A 110 of the Hennig Statute, which is the statutory section immediately prior to 53A 110A, which is simple trespass. So I need to look at whether or not this policy and policies like it, governor's executive order, mask mandates, this sign-in policy, even though it may have been, let's just say, not artfully carried out to where it would have the maximum effectiveness with regard to protecting the public, whether it's reasonable or finds that it is. So now we're left with whether or not Mr. Ray has violated that lawful, the lawful conditions imposed on access to remaining in the premises. The court finds that he did. He entered and remained unlawfully in the building on, on June, uh, July 15, 2022. He did so because when asked to provide his name, decided to get the pass to, in theory, check on whether or not there was a maximum number of people allowed in the town clerk's office, he refused. He refused and then began uh, heading upstairs there in light of all the problems that came after that. Now, I point to June 10th, 2022, 2021, I'm sorry, both 2021, in the building, where he comes in with the notice of intent to sue. And he is also asked to sign in, refuses, and basically is not allowed upstairs. He does not push the envelope. He, uh, he speaks to uh, Mr. Janusa. Uh, officers come from uh, the Danbury Police Department. And then ultimately it's decided that the town clerk will come downstairs, take what he needs, go upstairs to her office, they stamp it, record it as he is requesting, and bring it back down to him, he agrees that that is a, uh, a reasonable uh, accommodation being made to him uh, because he is unwilling to comply uh, with the safety and security policy in effect at the time. So he knows that he is not going to be left upstairs to the second floor or beyond the foyer of the town clerk's office of, of, the, uh, of the city hall building, town hall building, unless he complies with the policy. And he essentially uh, agrees to that. By, by waiting, uh, agreeing to have this accommodation made for him, and then uh, leaving peaceably with no problem. On his way to his car, he tells his listeners, you know, I really, uh, I'm gonna come back and do a full audit. Today wasn't a full audit. Today was just, I have some things to do this afternoon. I'm gonna make sure the paper got filed, but we'll check on Danbury again. And he does, and that's July 15th. And he goes there then, arguably, with the express intention of pushing uh, the envelope with regard to the uh, efficacy of uh, the uh, safety and security policy in effect. Now, I'm not getting to the filming policy. I'm not getting to whether or not he, you know, reasonable doubt, violated the filming policy. Whether he stood in the foyer, whether he stood up to the up to the counter, whether ICE can trespass, whether ICE can't trespass. Because I found already that the behavior on the second floor is not so offensive as to constitute uh, a creating public disturbance. So it's arguable that Mr. Reyes, in fact, created a public disturbance that day, or certainly helped create the public disturbance. But under the statute, he did not create a public disturbance with regard to the criminal statute, which is titled such. So, uh, like I said, not guilty on creating public disturbance with regard to simple trespass. He went there. He uh, entered or remained in the building. That's clear from, this, from the video. It's clear uh, from the testimony of the uh, witnesses, including Mr. Reyes, with regard to his testimony uh, that we had the privilege to observe uh, on the video. He remained in the building. That's clear for all the same reasons. The question is whether or not he was not licensed or privileged to do so. No notice has to be provided. That's criminal trespass one. It is, though, a finding I have to make beyond a reasonable doubt whether or not he knew 
he couldn't go beyond that folder without signing in. And his conduct on June 10th indicates to me that he did, because on June 10th, he complied, and on July 15th, he made it his mission not to comply. With that being said, the court finds him guilty of simple trespass and posts a fine of $90 plus costs. Uh, I understand there may be uh, considerations, post verdict considerations that need to be made, so I will make that due and payable 30 days from now. 30 day date, four week days, 227 23. Mr. Reyes, you can make payment if you decide to make payment by uh, phone or uh, directly at the clerk's office before the time of uh, 226 23. 22623, no, I'm sorry, 22423 would be the would be the uh, Friday, 226 to Sunday. So up until 224, 2023 at 4 p.m. say you can make payment by phone or you can make payment uh, at the clerk's office directly. If it gets to Tuesday uh, or Monday the 27th, you have to be able to be here and, and explain why you haven't made payment because you're subject to failure to pay your plea uh, with regard uh, to that statute at that time. Uh, with regard to the constitutional implications, uh, I didn't go into the constitutional implications of whether that time, place, or manner restriction with regard to the film policy was an unconstitutional uh, uh, inhibition on his First Amendment right to film because I found him not guilty of creating public service on the facts alone and the, uh, and the element analysis with regard to uh, that particular statute. With regard to uh, 53A, 110A, uh, I didn't go into the uh, constitutional analysis either in that uh, I saw no evidence that it was not universally applied to everyone and also uh, with regard to him having an understanding that he was not licensed or to do so, I also found that the reason I've already indicated he certainly knew he wasn't licensed or privileged to go beyond the floor without the pass. Whether or not that particular policy was effective is uh, not something I needed to be able to find beyond a reasonable doubt. I needed only to be able to find that it existed and it was uh, a lawful condition and based upon uh, all that we saw during COVID, certainly this policy, as flawed as it may have been, was a lawful condition based upon Mr. Reyes' ability to enter the town hall building during that time. I have no evidence before me as to whether or not that policy is still in effect, but I think if it was, there would probably be other considerations any kind of fact finder would have to make with regard to ruling on the statutes and the elements of that particular statute. So with that being said, I want to thank both of you. Certainly it was a long time and it's never easy when you're doing the video. And certainly um, I'll make this one last comment is with regard to the professionalism of the media, uh, certainly that was, I think, uh, seamless. I appreciate that. Uh, but under the circumstances, I know this is going to become more and more common as we go forward. I think that uh, witnesses react differently when they know they're being videoed. Certainly, I think uh, we had two witnesses here that may have been less than responsive, uh, as we all would have liked, and then we had one witness that might have been overly responsive, trying to show that he was going to answer every question to the best of his ability. And so, uh, whether that or not that was colored by the fact that they knew they were going to be the subject of uh, YouTube scrutiny or whatever will come from this particular uh, recording of the proceeding we'll leave that for another day uh certainly. all right so let me just comment on what came out of the judge's mouth because i was a little upset that the judge found reyes not guilty on causing a public disruption i honestly feel in my opinion come on now you guys who watched it i'm sure most of you guys watched that video okay where uh reyes was inside there uh the office there the town clerk and phil was telling them, you can't record in here. You can't record the customers. You can't record the counter and beyond and so on. And he was, they were telling Reyes, you got to go. Reyes was not making any attempt to go. Now, let me just say this. If Reyes felt that he was in the right, or you got everything recorded now. You got these people uh, uh, putting their hands in front of your camera. You got them telling them you can't uh, 
telling him that they uh, he can't record there. You got it all on camera. Take it to the higher ups. You leave, take it to the higher ups or court, whatever the case may be, and you fight it that way. But to just stand there and, and argue, that's not the place to fight that shit. Again, I think we've all come to that uh, conclusion that you're fighting the wrong, these guys are fighting the wrong people. The, these people don't got shit to do with the rules. Their job is to enforce the rule. Even if they turn around and want to look out for you and say, okay, go ahead, this time, go ahead. I'm not going to say anything. I'm gonna, I'm, I didn't see you. Just go ahead. Go do what you got to do. That doesn't change shit. That doesn't change shit for the next guy who's trying to do the same bull crap, okay? If you're there to try to make changes, to make a, you want to get that a rule of no recording or signing in or whatever the case may be, you want to get that taken down, you take it up to it. The people who actually put the damn rule into effect. Those are the people that you're supposed to be fighting. Those are the people, they, those are the shot callers. Those are the ones that have that power to either uh, modify it, remove it, whatever, okay? But these poor employees, they ain't got shit to do with it. They, they, the frauders do it because they know it's going to bring content towards their, uh, uh, their subscribers, that's the way I see it, okay? So, again, the judge uh, giving him a, a not guilty on uh, causing public disturbance, my opinion, the judge just trying to, like, uh, play both sides of the fence. That's my opinion, okay? Oh, he did find him guilty for the trespassing, okay? Right on, okay? Uh, he's got to sign in like everybody else. Think about it. They even made, they even, they were working with him. You don't want to turn off your camera? We'll have the upstairs or town clerk come down give you your paperwork and um, you can fill it out that way and this way everybody's happy okay but that's not what Reyes wanted Reyes wanted to show his subscribers that the power he has that he can do whatever the hell he want to do okay uh, he can do whatever he wants to do he's going to go upstairs no matter what okay this bullshit that the, the lawyer was throwing out there that the forms never existed I doubt that very much uh, the city attorney as, as you heard Phil not only Phil was mentioning it but the city attorney also mentioned it when they were in the hallway uh, that now they got a, a a form there that anybody who goes there to record they has uh, they have to fill out that form and again so nobody thinks that Phil has a hard on with frauditors if you guys got to watch the video and I forget the name of the damn video but Rogue Nation Rogue Nation and another frauditor were at that same exact location and everything went great why because Rogue Nation gave that respect he signed in did everything that was called what was called of him to do he got in recorded great video now sean got a i don't know sean got this thing that he's some kind of badass okay the more subscribers he gets the more power he feels he has and that is a very dangerous thing that is a very dangerous thing guys that's all i gotta say let me know your thoughts on the video guys and i will see you in my next video Council did the best they could and were diligent in their efforts with regard to uh, their obligations. And as the prosecutor handling the matter, and as the defense counsel handling the matter, I appreciate that. Mr. Ray, so you were nothing but a gentleman here throughout, and I appreciate that as well. So, with that being said, not guilty, creating public disturbance, guilty, simple trespass. Continue four weeks for payment, or the termination would be any kind of post judgment matter which would stop the payment. Any further, many of the parties. Yes. Uh, no, you're not. No, you're not. Thank you. We're going to adjourn. All right. Of course, now Steven Seagar. What's your reaction? He got convicted on trespassing. Not guilty. Not guilty when it comes to creating a disturbance. What do you make of it? Well, I mean, I didn't think he was guilty of creating a public disturbance from the outset. I think the judge reasoned his way through it uh, in a way that makes sense and also accords with the law. What was going on in the town clerk's office on the day that Mr. Reyes was arrested was not offensive conduct. Uh, for, among other reasons, people continue to talk to him. He wasn't insulting anybody in a way that would offend community standards. So I think the judge hit the nail right in the head with his decision. 
not to convict uh, Sean Paul of creating public disturbance. And on the trespass, if Sean had signed in as Mickey Mouse on the day, then he could not have been charged for this based on what the judge said. Yes, I think that, uh, you know, that deserves a little bit more attention if you're going to uh, analyze that statute against the backdrop of a First Amendment, right? Uh, because as you say, there was no real legitimate COVID purpose the signing sheet uh, was there for. Uh, in addition to all that, yeah, I mean, I think there was one gentleman in one of the videos that you guys uh, had out before, or he had out, where he signs in as uh, Captain America, and the one witness that didn't testify, Mr. Janusa, he actually asks Sean Paul when he comes in the door, hey, are you that guy? Are you awesome? No, no, I'm Sean Paul Reyes. And, you know, so to me, I think that that policy, if it's still in existence, it definitely should be changed. Uh, but I would suspect they've changed and revamped it uh, because as it stands now, it's confusing to people and, and to me didn't serve any viable purpose, including COVID purposes. In the audit community, a lot of people accuse cops and public servants of being tyrants. It sounds like we've now had a judge go on the record saying calling somebody a tyrant is not grossly offensive. No, I think it's clear that this judge didn't agree that calling a government official a tyrant uh, uh, while you're characterizing his activity is not offensive conduct. It's not offensive speech. It's not offensive anything. And, you know, I think, uh, hey, look, nowadays everything's on film. People better get used to it. And I think the judge, the judge knows that. Why did this thing go on so long? This thing went on uh, a long time because there were First Amendment issues and I think that everybody that's involved, the way that the technology nowadays is being sort of infiltrating our lives, we have like new legal issues that need to be decided. And here, it's a combination. I mean, uh, it's a serious question of whether or not the First Amendment should trump the statutes that are at issue. The state had already dropped the charges from uh, criminal charges to uh, civil ch or to infractions, sorry. And I think this judge wanted to give everybody their day in court. Uh, I think it went as long as it did because the prosecutor, uh, although he inherited the case, that given his experience and background, you know, maybe he wasn't too happy about that. Um, he, the prosecution could have dropped this months ago. They could have taken the criminal infractions when they dropped it, the citations. They could have gotten rid of the whole thing and probably saved the state nine days worth of a trial. No, they could have. And I think some people think that um, the amount of money the government spends on a trial sometimes wasted money. But as you sit there in the chair and, you know, it's your it's your name on the line, it's your conduct that's on the line. Everybody wants to get a fair shake. And here, although I disagree on the uh, trespass analysis, I think that it was reasoned through in a way that makes that decision colorable. I think the only thing that we have to do now is try to analyze the thing more completely for appeal. We tried to do things to preserve the record uh, consistent with that. And let's let it settle for the next few days and see where it goes. But uh, I'm fairly confident that uh, an appeal for this uh, lies. It's, it's, ready. It's, 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 it's a viable appeal. It's ready to go. And uh, it's all up to uh, Mr. Reyes now. But I, I think that what he's done is he championing the, uh, the First Amendment. And do we have to temper that as auditors? I don't know. We don't know enough about what the case law says and this whole concept of goading somebody or, or getting somebody doing a Jedi mind trick on government officials to get them to talk. I think it's just a, a red herring. I don't think it really has anything to do with the analysis. I mean, uh, Sean, I want to ask you your reaction, because when most people look at this, they're going to say, oh, my God, the amount of resources that the prosecutors threw at this, they were looking to try to make you blink. You didn't blink and you proved to them that, in fact, calling somebody a tyrant is not grossly offensive. And they got you on a policy that's no longer in place for trespass. What's your reaction? So first, first and foremost, I want to thank my attorney, Stephen Seeger. He did an amazing job uh, throughout this trial. He gave me a wise legal counsel. Uh, he represented me well. I'm very pleased. I just think that this, like you mentioned, David, this is a gross waste of taxpayer resources for a $90 fine, which ultimately turned out to be a $90 fine. Um, when you look at the, the aspects of a $10,000 bond and paying $1,000 of that to be released, compared to the $90 fine of the legal expenses that go throughout this on both sides, on the defense, as well as the prosecution. It just seems absurd. And to that effect, you know, I did hear the state's attorney who was prosecuting me say that this was a stupid infraction trial. I wouldn't agree with that statement only because it exposed city officials the state's attorney's office, the whole apparatus, police department, working together 
for retaliation. This comes down to the Danbury Public Library incident where Officer Utter said 20 years ago I'd have been dead with my teeth missing and that he would have done it himself. 20 years ago that motherfucker would be dead. He'd be fucking his teeth would be missing. I don't fucking do it. I'd have removed his teeth. He would be dead. This is not going to end well with you, you know that. Okay, we'll see. No, we'll I'm see. telling you. I can see it in your eyes. In law enforcement experience. Yeah. I'm still here. After they released Reyes and he went outside, Officer Ken Utter taunted him. Constitutionally protected You're activity. Wrong. If I went in there You're and wrong. I was acting like an asshole, You're wrong. Don't, don't touch me. Don't You're touch wrong. me. Don't touch me. Hey. 20 years ago, that motherfucker would be dead. He'd be fucking his teeth if he does it. I don't fucking do it. I'm still here. I'm still here. 20 years ago, that motherfucker would be dead. I'm still here. He's fucking his teeth if he doesn't. I'm still here. I don't fucking do it. Police Chief Patrick Ridenour is well respected, and when he saw the video of Officer Ken Utter saying he would have killed Reyes 20 years ago, the chief suspended Officer Utter. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. Leading up to me peacefully exercising my rights into City Hall. All of this prosecution, I had four criminal charges, as you stated earlier. Those were dropped. I, I hired one of the best attorneys in Connecticut because I was ready for a jury trial. I was ready to represent myself in front of a jury of my peers. Now, he, Stephen could probably uh, explain better why it is that they took out what type of strat if it's like a strategy of some sort, why they dropped the criminal charges. So I'm denied my jury trial right. And now I'm before a bench trial because I my personal belief is if this was a case before a jury between the coaching between you know i'm not a violent person that he's he's, he's cordial he's polite you know there was no reason for this fictional policy to play any type of deal the, the, the policy of signing in was and everybody has watched the videos has seen phil janusa signs people in he knew my name he knew it wasn't captain awesome he said my name was sean paul reyes he could have easily signed my name on the day of my arrest he could have easily handed me a card on the day of my arrest he chose not to do either and ignore both of those policies and i and i truly believe that i was licensed and privileged to be in city hall as any citizen would be phil janusa chose to put his hands on you and say that he would drop you like a tree he was not charged we saw some evidence that perhaps the city clerk uh, lied perjured herself on the witness stand there's not going to be any sort of um, problem for her except in the court of public opinion um and danbury seems to feel like okay they're getting sean paul reyes to pay 90 dollars. what's your reaction uh, it's just absurd it's really absurd you know it there was no justice here today. I would like to think that the criminal justice system is supposed to spawn some sort of justice. There was no justice. Ninety dollars for you know exercising my rights. That's 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 not even the point here. The point is is that Phil Janusa should have been on trial. He should have been charged. You know whether it was an assault, a disorderly conduct, a creating a public disturbance. What he definitely broke the law. He pushed me several times, like you just said. I'll put you through the wall. I'll knock you down like trees. I like those are threatening statements. Again, it's just ridiculous. That's 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 really what it comes down to. Well, good luck to both of you guys on appeal and everything else. Thank and thanks for uh, for a remarkable trial. And and I will just say that I fully plan to appeal this decision. Um, it's not about the ninety dollars. It's never been about the the ninety dollars or the potential one hundred and eighty dollars. It's the principle of the matter. It's our First Amendment right. If you can make these crazy policies and just because you don't want somebody in your building and try and selectively enforce them because he could have written, written my name in the book he could have gave me a card you know it, it just seems silly to me and i will appeal and hopefully the a higher court will find that i am not guilty all right you guys thank you thanks nice appreciate it appreciate it hey, hey, sure. when am i going to see you again now oh, yeah. i'm going to see you